Okay. Should I stop now? Or? Yes. Okay. So I'll present three processes. Well, actually two. Um, this will mainly be, be focused on the next to leading order computations in the shockwave framework uh, for the exclusive diffractive impact factors. So we'll present the exclusive digest production, exclusive longitudinal row meson production, and exclusive transverse row meson production. And for that, I will need to present two formalisms. So one of them will be the so-called shockwave formalism. That's Jan Baritsky's description of what people call the color glass condensate, which is a bit different from what Thomas is using. For example, LCPT. Some people still use LCPT. So I'll just go briefly for that. Then I'll have to introduce collinear factorization at twist three, because I want to combine twist three collinear factorization and the shockwave formalism for low T production. So I'll try to be quick, but I still need to present a couple of things. So okay, the shockwave framework is a pure small x um, framework, which is an extension of the FTL, basically. So the kinematics are a rigid group of kinematics. So for DIS, for example, we'll have this hot uh, Q square for the photon. And then uh, the center of mass energy here, S, is supposed to be very large. And so the hierarchy is Q square much lower than S. And this guy will, will carry a very large momentum around P plus, typically square root of S, and this guy around P minus square root of S. So the whole point of this formalism is to separate and factorize in P plus space. So I'm separating my gluonic field into what I'm calling a fast field and a slow field. Fast field being the one with K plus among uh, greater than a given cutoff, and slow fields with K plus lower than a given cutoff. So effectively, I'm just splitting my gluonic field this way and expanding my QC Lagrangian in these fields. I'm building effective pattern law. So the whole shockwave approximation is related to the small x limit in this description. So here, I'm taking those slow gluons, typically somewhere in target stress frame, and boosting everything to go to the a typical projectile rest frame, knowing that the projectile P plus is roughly square root of S, so it's very big. So the longitudinal boost I have to use to go from that rest frame to that rest frame here is typically square root of S, and that gives me a field which has a very interesting behavior. So the field transforms this way, as you all know, it's a typical Lorentz transformation. And for lambda very large, you get that this just becomes a delta of X plus, doesn't have any dependence on X minus, and uh, this guy is much lower than this guy. So the shockwave approximation is uh, taking these three limits. So delta of x plus, uh, only a dependence on the transverse coordinate, and coupling with one pseudo-convective. And that's coming back a little bit to the discussions we had on Monday, that um, if you're studying jet wenching, people will compute the corrections to this approximation, which correspond to energy loss, so the conservation of p plus but you could also have, in principle, other corrections from this approximation. So that's what the, the discussion was. So anyway, I will just stick to completely icon also this form for my external field for the whole rest of the talk. Now, what is nice is the interaction with such a field can be exponentiated into a path order integral in Z plus, and uh, which means that effectively all of the infinite exchange of gluons in the T channel just, uh, just summed up into one result. So I have one effective particle in a T-channel, which couples to gamma plus and only carries a transverse momentum. So for example, a quark propagator here just propagates freely here. It gets a kick from the shock waves at like on time zero, and then it just uh, propagates or gives you a line, whatever. So I'm building completely covariant Feynman rules for that, and with very nice gamma matrices instead of some delta overlicities or epsilon or whatever, I just have good old uh, direct matrices. So that's what I'm, I'll be playing with. There is one remark to be done, is if you want to exponentiate the interaction with the external fields, here, for lines, you can start as one. So not interacting can still be absorbed here into the trivial Wilson line identity. If you're playing at higher twist, you'll have to be very careful with that, and we'll see how, but we have to distinguish whether you're scattering or not if you're playing with fields. This will matter for low t. But so far, so good. I, I just have effective Feynman rule with complete Wilson lines, and I can just build my 
uh, impact factors with this. So the factor I just pictures is uh, this one. So the amplitude is the convolution of a, an impact factor, which I'm computing with my effective Feynman rules, and the action of my Wilson line operators on the target states. So that would be uh, your dipole proton scattering amplitude, for example, for a forward dipole. Or more interestingly, for exclusive diffraction, you would get the non-diagonal action of a dipole at the amplitude level. So that's a very um, interesting observable for us, um, is exclusive diffraction. And as people pointed out last week, the dijet production in that case gives you the, the dipole Wigner function. So that's a very interesting process. So anyway, this is your generic factorization. So you have this eta, which is the cutoff on P plus space, and you're just convoluting the impact factor evaluated at eta with uh, dipole operators acting on the states, but evaluated at eta. And this is valid for any color representation, not just dipole. So the, the color is given by the is giving you the structure of Wilson lines operator on which you with which you are acting on the targets, and the factorization feature will be the same. But again, I'm saying saturation uh, factorization, which means that I have to get rid of the dependence of, on my uh, arbitrary scale, and that's what the Baryski hierarchy is for, right? So if I'm just changing that rapidity cutoff, I get diagrams to resum, and they lead to the bg monk hierarchy of equations, which evolve a dipole into a double dipole. This double dipole also would evolve into higher operators, and that's standard for most of the people here. Now, if I'm taking the midfield approximation or the planar limit, then this equation becomes closed because, again, midfield approximation means that the uh, matrix element of this guy is just a product of matrix elements and you're with the Baryski Kuchekov equation with this term saturation. Now, what I want to point out, point out because I had remarks from uh, phenomenologists who use mostly CGC. I didn't assume anything on the target here. This is a pure small x approximation. It's an extension of BFKL. I don't need saturation for this process to apply. That's quite important for, because people are sometimes reluctant to use that for regular small x. It still works. It's an extension. So anyway, that's my, that's my formalism. Now, I will discuss how to compute impact factors at NLO for the rest of this talk, but I just have to remind now, even though it's kind of controversial now, apparently, the way you're supposed to convert it, in my simplistic understanding of it, is I'm computing my impact factor. I'm building non perturbative models for the matrix elements of the target, uh, of the Wilson lines acting on the target. Uh, with this model, I'm solving BG mock with uh, initial conditions at a typical rapid, uh, target P plus. And once I have my solution, I'm convoluting that solution at a typical projectile P plus. So I would evolve from target to projectile in that case. So anyway, I will only discuss this part, not the non perturbative matrix. So that's for uh, shockwave the treatment of the CGC. Now I'll just go give some details on Colina factorization at higher twist, which might be more informative for our small X people. So I will discuss two schemes because if, there are, if you're going at higher twist, things start to be complicated. So factorization in momentum space is not too simple. So the basic principle, which you all know, is that you're splitting your impact factor um, into a hard part and the, so for low meson production, for example, and a soft part, which is given by the vacuum to meson matrix element of some operator. So the leading operator for low meson is just a quark and an anti-quark. But you could have, for example, a meson being formed from a quark anti-quark and a blue. So that would be a three-body amplitude and so on and so forth. But typically here, the factorization is that you have summation over spinner and color indices, and you have some convolution in coordinates here or in the momentum of the outgoing quark or outgoing quark and outgoing blue. So anyway, first thing I'm doing is just a simple field decomposition. This factorizes color and spinner spaces, and this is quite trivial for everyone here. And I'm left with this kind of matrix element. R means a source of the order of the coming photon, yes? Out for the moment, I didn't say, but yes, typically you would have one hard momentum and one hard scale, given by the yeah, square of this momentum, typically. And um, a lot of dictionaries, Czech people call working hard, we call so what exactly do you mean? Well, in that case, my hard scale is the virtuality of the photon. So this photon is carrying a large P plus hard momentum. Blob, hard blob. Is it clock weight of transverse momentum or order of Q or 
Well, I have to assume, no, in that case, Q is not a large scale. So you have transverse momenta from the T-channel, but you're assuming that they are somehow lower than Q. I, I, I will be left with results which are still right if Q equals zero for large T. So I think my decomposition is a bit uh, more involved or but more wrong. In what, in what variable? In transverse momentum still? Or in uh, I'll show you factorization in momentum okay. space in, in a second. But, but typically my hard scale for D, I guess, would be just Q squared here. That's for but so, okay, I'm left with those matrix elements convoluting with generic part, so I want to perform a two-section turn of these guys. So now you have two schemes, the so-called Lycon collinear factorization and the covariant collinear factorization. So Lycon collinear factorization is typically used by, I think, uh, Nikin and Teriyaev, and covariant collinear factorization would be by Steve Brown. Anyway, so their approach for Lycon collinear factorization is you're factorizing by performing a Taylor expansion of the hard part along the collinear direction. So I'm saying that this quark line entering the matrix element has typically X times the momentum of the meson. So that's the, the, the collinear approximation. So what I'm doing is I'm Taylor expanding this guy along a collinear direction. So I'm defining a new Sudakov vector, introducing X as the fraction along that vector, and then I'm performing Taylor expansion along xp. So for p quark equal xp meson plus blah, 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 performing this expansion. Now, the leading term is very easy. That's perfectly fine. If you're going to the next leading term, so the twist three, uh, you are left with that. And now you can integrate this guy by parts to give you a correlator here, which has derivatives at in the quark field. <coughs> And this will be your twist three operator for two body contributions in the uh, light cone collinear approach. Now, this is a standard derivative, which everyone hates. You need a covariant derivative. And to do that, you need a three body contribution. So you will get some psi bar g a mu psi to combine with this guy. And that's a good reason to get an intuition that you need three body contributions for that process. So sorry, just to return to the bigger picture, what are you trying to do? Uh, so what I'm doing in practice, yeah. so I'm factorizing in T-channel using the shockwave uh, formalism. So I'm performing first my factorization in S. And then in the S-channel, I'm performing a collinear factorization by just doing a twist expansion of that there. So I first factorize in S and then in Q squared. So why do you need to do the collinear factorization in the channel? Well, because the main reason is I'm going at NLO, so I need an evolution equation, and I don't have an evolution equation if I'm taking the full wave function. So that would be maybe the answer. Or full wave function. You just so have to calculate the impact. Yeah, typically at low x, people would just say that you're convoluting okay. your half part, so the wave function of the photon splitting into quark and type r, with the wave function of the row splitting into quark and type r. You cannot do that at NLO, because you need to cancel some divergence. Yeah, I thought you have, in the part function, you have parameter q, and you are using this parameter, m rho to mq, am I right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In the impact, in the impact of there is m rho, what's mq? Mass of the, oh, q squared. Oh, well. So you're performing an expansion of the mass of the row over Q. Okay, because you're saying if you just take with the leading order or whatever, some phenomenological row wave function, yep. then, and you start correcting your input factor, you have the linear singularities and you need contributions like on the right. That would be your so answer you for NLO. But no, it's so also... You this expansion, you have nothing. You don't know what is row so what, what do you need? Well, usually people just say that the uh, Romeson is just uh, gamma mu, like u bar gamma yeah, mu, u, and other low Light cone expansion, whatever, before you write down the formula. Well, I would agree, but most people just plug in some non local vertex, time a function which gives you the spin of the row. Uh, and then you can't have detailed row wave functions that are widely used in phenomenology. Right. It's not yes. just plugging in a gamma plus. There, there are wave functions uh, which various groups have developed. What did you do in your pioneer paper? We we put some people's wave functions in right. okay. <laughs> in previous pioneers. <laughs> and then Mark and Nolia filled it up here and threw it back just here and there and that way, and it fit perfectly. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> so, so nothing else left to do. <laughs> no so you, yeah, okay, so order, you, oh, sorry, so order, you could build a per, uh, leading order in a phenomenological model in our class. I'm talking loop corrections. Maybe I wasn't clear about that. I, I will talk about NLO row error production. Uh, 
but analog production for low meson, you cannot just plug your wave function in and, and just do nothing. You have Both collinear of the linear singularities. Or yes. What? So what is the issue? You start putting. So I mean, well, you, you have what Thomas did uh, earlier today. He didn't do any collinear factorization. Yeah, because he had photons. Photons, you're fine. If you have a low meson, you need a non perturbative I, 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 I wasn't producing anything non perturbative in the final set. I was looking right. at gamma star, and gamma star, the so the gamma, gamma star, gamma star to row. Yeah. And you need to have some information about the row. Yeah, I, I have a non perturbative matrix element, and I need an evolution equation for that. If it's a wave function, I don't know how to do an, but, but an evolution you equation. And you need the evolution because you have some mu squared dependence in your. Well, I, I'll come to that, but basically the evolution for those guys, yes. you're just renormalizing these fields and they give you the evolution equation for the distribution amplitude. It's kind of like the GLAP, but the, well, that's called right, the RBL, but it's the same. But the reason you need it is because you have some log mu squared divergences. I have the, one uh, over the, epsilon uh, divergences, which I need to get rid of. Right, and you, yeah, which, which come from calculating an low input factor. And you yes. have to cancel them, and if you just take a phenological wave function, it's not going to cancel them. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I wasn't clear. I, I was just giving the formalism, then going to what I'm doing, but that's probably more, <laughs> more confusing than anything. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, I just wanted to give you some intuition why you need a three body contribution, and that for like on collinear factorization is just to make this guy get generated. That's the main intuition you can get. Now, uh, at twist two. It's very easy. You just take your matrix element, so the linear one, psi bar gamma mu psi, and parameterize it this way. Now, uh, the point is, if your row meson is longitudinally polarized, you can write this, and this is perfectly fine. If it's transversely polarized, the twist two distribution amplitude is chiral odd. So if you want to do DIS, like gamma star to rho, you will never get this kind of contribution. You want to cancel that. And gamma star to rho t starts at twist three. That's the bottom line. And that's why I'm doing all this mess about collinear factorization. I will discuss the twist three process because it's not the correction, it's really, that's the leading term. Okay, uh, it's probably not too useful to go into details for that. The, the point is you, you require a lot of distribution amplitudes. You have distribution amplitudes with derivatives, with gamma mu, gamma mu, gamma phi, and three body contributions. Three body with real blue or F blue or? What do you mean real blue? I mean, I will come to that in a, in a second. In like on, in like on collinear factorization, I can tell you, your blooms from the gauge links are the same as the derivative terms. A derivative acting on a hot propagator gives you the ins insertion of a gluon field which has zero, which is one of your gauge blooms. So that's the matching. But anyway, so you have seven distribution amplitudes. You have equations of motion for your operators, so just solving that reduces the, the number of distribution amplitudes. And in right concollinear factorization, you introduced a new Sudakov vector, and you have to have some independence on this Sudakov vector, which gives you one equation for gauge invariance and two equations which link distribution amplitudes together. So eventually you had two less distribution amplitudes, and you're left with three. Okay, so now that's what my colleagues used to compute the analog impact factor for, uh, for OT, sorry, the leading order impact factor for OT in BFTR. I want to apply the shockwave framework, and my point is this guy is much more convenient if you're using shockwave. So this guy is a much nicer way. You're just looking at gauge invariant operators, so with gauge links here, and performing a two-stack transfer directly on this guy. You're not touching the hard part, you're just guessing that if you have an open index, it will couple with the half momentum, and if you have dimension, it will be compensated by one over the half scale. So any open index gives you plus one, every uh, dimension gives you minus one, hence the term twist, expansion, which is dimension minus spin, right? So, so in case anyone wondered why people use twist. So here you're just writing gauge invariant operators in coordinate space and expanding those guys on the diagram. So the point is you only need five distribution amplitudes because you don't have to introduce this additional uh, light convector, which makes your life difficult. So, okay, anyway, you have five and you have two equations of motion, so you're left with three. So my colleagues computed the row T impact factor in BFKL with this set of distribution amplitudes, then with this one, and then they matched the three basic distribution amplitudes. 
So they solved the equation of uh, Sudakov independence in LCCF uh, for that specific hard part. Uh, my point is you can actually find a perfect one-to-one -one matching between those with a complete generic group. Whatever the hard part will be, you can find this perfect scanning. And that's what I will use eventually to compare my results to theirs. So I will use that for my results. And then with this dictionary, which is completely general, at least three, I will match those. Sorry, so before you go on, so when you say they computed it in BFKL, you mean just usual teaching formulas? Yes. As opposed to what you're trying to do, which is sort of a short Yes, way. exactly. Uh, the, yeah, the, the point is they're using the FKL, and I'm interested in EIC, so I want the saturation term. And the expansion is, uh, well, you have to do it again. Okay, so Sorry, now. What are those abbreviations again? LCCF? LICON, collinear factorization, and covariant collinear factorization. Okay. LICON, because you're introducing this Sudako vector, and collinear, because, uh, covariant, because you're just computing these covariant operators, which are gauge independent and very interesting. So anyway, that was a bit technical, but uh, okay. So let's do <laughs> practice. Now. Can't do this first. Uh, sorry. Uh, so let's do practice. I'm going to do open pattern production at NLO in the shop of Kramer, which most of you probably heard from me already. But again, I repeat, I have completely general kinematics, whatever my target is. It can be whatever I need, and I'm using a rigid group of limit and using I'm the shop. Sorry. sorry? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and again, my, my regularization would be the same as formats, which was why I was puzzled by this uh, mass renormalization issues, because I would probably have the same, even though I'm using covariant. Mm -hmm. no, but so anyway, I'm mass. In some sense, so if you look at how mass renormalization, there, there, there are calculations of uh, mass renormalization in covariant gauge in. I'm sorry, you like to engage covariant perturbation theory. So you do get the right result, but it's really tricky because you have some. Uh, <laughs> I don't know the details, but it, but it does get tricky in some sense you run into the same problems. Uh, sure. Okay, it's just that you were saying this was a matter of splitting Lagrangian to Hamiltonian. Uh, that sounds weird to me because I'm expecting the same issues. That, that, that's all. So in that case, in that case, of course, you're working in the you can just have a Lagrangian. Uh, in that case, the way the way it goes is that then I don't remember the detail. I don't, remember, I don't even remember the reference. But the question is, the point is that a lot of what you do when you do calculations in uh, when you do calculations in dimensional regularization, the, the point of dimensional regularization is that it's or it's Lorentz invariant, and then you have this n vector, the gauge vector, which which breaks rota breaks Lorentz invariant because you chose a specific vector. So it, it becomes, so somehow it becomes a technical problem to actually get the right result when you manipulate dimensional, d-dimensional integrals where you have this n. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh, so, 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 so one, in some way you hit the same problem. But yeah. It's like you're using physical tools to regulate the Chalai divergences and then you start to use the gauge Because it's cut off. Yeah. In your case, it breaks more. Yes. It's an artifact of the... It's an artifact of the regularization, right, so. so anyway, let's get practical, as I say. So my leading order uh, diagram for open problem production is just the gamma splits into a Q-bar pair. And for these lines, I'm using my effective Feynman rules, which give me the convolution with one Wilson line here, the adjoint Wilson line here. And since I'm doing exclusive diffraction, I will just trace them and act on the target fields. So I have the off-diagonal dipole already at level, and that's my convolution. Um, yeah, that's probably all there is to say. If I'm going at NLO, I have two kinds of contributions. Uh, either my gluon travels through like on time zero, and then it scatters, or it doesn't. If it doesn't, the convolution is exactly the same. I just have a dipole, so that's my term. I have CF times the dipole with NLO corrections here. If it scatters, and then that's the splitting Edmund was discussing this morning, I guess, uh, the, the, the Wilson line operator associated to these diagrams has two forms. You have a double dipole term here, and you have a dipole times CF term. So I'm not sure if it matches his NC to CF decomposition, but basically if this guy goes through the, 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 the shockwave fields but does not scatter, it's just still a dipole, so that's what you get. And if it does scatter, you get the double dipole. 
But still, the convolution is the same. You just have an additional momentum here in your double dipole contribution. Okay. Uh, the real corrections to open button production have the same form. So if it's if the blue one is not scattering, you just get a dipole. If it is scattering, you will get a double dipole contribution. And you just sum all these guys together. So now I have my effective Feynman rules. I can write diagrams, and I can regulate this diagram with my uh, cutoff and K plus and uh, dimensional regularization for transverse space. And I get a bunch of, uh, of, uh, of divergences. Um, okay. Point is you get every single possible divergence in QCD. You get the usual UV, soft, or collinear, or even soft and collinear divergences. And you get the rapidity divergence, which is the curious gauge pole, P plus going to zero, regardless of P transverse. And you want to cancel that. There is one you can cancel here at the open part on level, and that's the rapidity divergence. The rapidity divergence is only touching the virtual corrections with the double dipole operator. And you have to remember this double dipole operator is the right hand side of GMORG for the dipole. So you actually do have a counter term to those divergences from the evolution of the leading order convolution. So my dipole times the BK kernel actually evolved into something which will combine with my, uh, with my analog double dipole and using the BGMORG equation in dimensions and in transverse space, in transverse momentum space, because that's what we needed, you get that uh, the evolution of flat convolution towards a uh, typical factorization scale in K plus gives me this log of factorization scale over, uh, over arbitrary cutoff to the double dipole contribution. And just adding those two, I'm losing any dependence on my arbitrary cutoff I'm left with one epsilon, but you have to believe me that the one over epsilon here are just artifacts of the use of transverse momentum uh, space instead of coordinate space here. If you just remember that those guys are gauge invariant, that uh, if any of the dipole is small, it just cancels. Just doing that, you can actually cancel those artifacts. Exactly, it's not an approximation or whatever. Just, uh, if you don't have a dependence on P3, in front of the one of the epsilon terms, integrating over P3 would shrink this double dipole to zero, and then you get an exact zero. So that's just an artifact of our use. So if you're adding the double dipole rapidity divergence to the leading order times dipole evolved, you get rid of any uh, regulator. So you just have the actual factorization scale, and that's it. It's perfectly fine. Right? So that's one. The second one, the UV divergence, is what I was saying this morning that you have that pole diagrams, which you should in principle take into account, but you're setting them to zero in dimensional regularization. Yeah, your pole cell phone, I think that pole. Oh, this one is uh, it's for a non-shell massless quark, so it is a that pole effectively if you're just computing that. You're saying the integral is the same as for a that pole uh, The integral is a that pole integral. Book, it's called cell phone? Yeah, that pole oh. is something. Like no, no, that, I mean the integral is a that pole type integral. Yeah, 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 sure. That's the integral you get. But of course, yeah, this but diagram does doesn't look like a that. I mean the integral. You confused all of us. Sorry. <laughs> so all of the, the integral become a that pole? Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a stainless integral, which is zero. Yeah. But strictly speaking, you it's just not get the same. D Okay, okay, maybe I shouldn't be using that for as a word. Well. K minus K squared, right? Yeah, so I'm this not is understanding how, the, how the, you don't get any momentum running inside the... You have momentum, but basically this is like D2K over K squared. It's a scaleless integral. But you D2K over K squared isn't going to be zero. That gives you one over epsilon. Exactly, but you get one over epsilon infrared and one over epsilon UV. So either you're saying this is one over epsilon infrared, and you're multiplying this by square root of Z, which will cancel your UV divergence, or you're just saying, this is zero and I don't need that. That's what people do, usually. So you, you, can't, you can't say infrared in the ultraviolet. Yeah, okay. that, that's exactly. A, a tadpole is something very different. A tadpole is something like the d squared k without any k squared k, dmk. Ah. And that's zero just because you don't have a dimensionless, you don't have a dimensionful parameter to use. You can't use yeah. the mu of dimensional regularization as a prefactor to get a dimension when you do it, it's just a d squared k. And that's a tadpole. This mm. divergence uh, has no problem with finding the mu 
like you say in the infrared and the ultraviolet cancel, when you're exactly on shell. Off shell it won't cancel. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 I agree. So this is, an, this is sort of an, an on shell normalization scheme that you're doing. Yes. Well, okay, I would, I would stop using the word that point. That's confusing. Yeah, if you put in counter terms in, an off in any off shell scheme, you would have to have a counter term for this. Uh, this yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is on shell and mass stress. Uh, that's, uh, that's the reason why it works. So the point is, if you're setting all these diagrams to zero, you should not mind what's UV, what's infrared, because the UV will actually cancel exactly the infrared. Now, there's still a divergence in that graph coming from the Z factor, I guess, right? This is just the mass factor. But there has to be a Z2 coming there, which won't be zero. You mean the longitudinal fraction again? No, 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 not referring to divergence. The traditional Z2. See, so suppose this is an electrodynamic. Yeah, so no, no, Z2 would cancel this, and this will cancel the hard part. Oh, okay. Z, 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 Z2s, mm -hmm. uh, Z2s are not going to, in general, cancel out. Uh, they're going to cancel vertex corrections. They're not going to cancel out by themselves. Yes. If this were electrodynamics rather than a yang mill theory, you would have Z1, Z2 cancels that we talked about earlier. What is this? I'm sorry? What is it? Say, more of the More of the identity, yes. But that's not zero because of the argument you're giving here. Well, it's a combination of arguments. You have UV divergences in there, in the vertex correction as yes. well. And those, if you're taking all the Zs and these diagrams, all of these will sum to zero in the UV, well, and you're just with the then, infrared part then of then it. Then it's a little bit misleading. You draw that graph, and you say that's the answer for that graph. You say that, that thing you wrote below is for all the graphs. Is it for all the well, graphs or for the self -energy? No, no, it's just this one. This one is okay. a diagram I'm never writing because it is zero because I'm using that rule. I don't believe the Z2 of that graph is zero. No, it's not. But, uh, but the Z2 is that graph. Z2 is the UV part of that graph. But then if you're taking out Z2, you still have to get the infrared part of that graph into your hard part. Okay. And so then the UV here will cancel the Z2s and the infrared remaining part will cancel the remaining parts here. So the choice no. also uh, redistributing the diversity. You see, but it's a little bit confusing what you're saying. You're saying that graph is zero. But then you're saying, oh, well, there's part of that zero which is going to cancel a Z1 coming from someplace. It's your choice. It's your choice to redistribute the diversity. No, I, 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 I can understand this through some choice, but I'm a little bit upset by if you draw this graph and you say it's zero. But then you're going to use part of it as Z2, which is not zero. No, so no, 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 no,
And I insist on evaluating something off shelf because you know, this is going to appear in a bigger graph. You're going to have to go off shelf. Right? Now, if you don't have that Z2 counter term, you will have an infinite infinite in this graph because you won't have infrared and ultraviolet canceling. No, so, sorry, why said, do you want this to go to another graph? Ultimately, with many different but graphs. He knows that. So it's huge individual regularization. The infrared, the ultraviolet are blind. You don't know what you want. Well, you can if you're a pure. Unless, that, unless, that's the okay. case. You put a regulator for the mass, of, and, and, and then if you. You know, you can separate the infrared and the light, but if you don't, I don't even know that much. Yeah, no, no, but uh, that's kind of my point. I'm trying to say exactly. that if I'm not using any Zs or anything which would cancel the UV part of those, I can and the infrared would cancel and the, infrared would cancel the ring term. Since yeah, but you see, you take that graph and you put it inside a bigger graph, and then you're well, well, Why do you want to put it in a bigger? Because graph? I want to. Well, look, that, if that's not the, if that comes into a row meson in the end, those graphs are going to be integrated off shelf. Not this. These do not belong to the impact factor. If you're using no, that, Let's not talk just about impact. Let's talk about it, just a graph. We got yeah. a, a virtual photon comes into uh, into a quark anti quark, and that's going to go into something else. You're going to have to integrate over those two quark lines. Yes. They're going to go off shell. You're right. going to you you have to regularize that graph off shell also. So basically, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the, the point that you are you are never putting those external quarks. Of shell, you always have them on shell because of the way you're treating is the prime. Yes, and, yes and no. Yes and no. Off shell, you don't have any more dk over k square pair. No, no, but, no, no. I agree with the remark. If you're using longitudinal raw meson production at NLO, exactly. this guy will enter a distribution of okay. This guy will have two parts. You have an UV part which gives you the Z, which renormalizes the distribution amplitude. Yes. And you have a collinear part, which yeah. will cancel here, the collinear divergence. Yeah. So if you want, you can be very clean and do that. Or you're just taking your diagrams, except this one, you have a collinear divergence, and you're canceling the collinear divergence with the RBL right away, which is effectively exactly what you're doing. If you're adding this diagram, which is zero, and putting part here and part here. You're just splitting a zero into two parts. Yes, it, it's zero when it's on shell. It's not zero when it's off shell in a big in a bigger part of the graph. Yes, but once you perform your collinear factorization and you cancel your divergences, you set those guys on shell. Okay, so it's not worthwhile. It's not worthwhile talking about. But you see, what you're saying is effectively, I think, you're saying that when you write down counter terms to Lagrangian, you don't need to put in z ones and z two. Not always. Not always. It depends so, on so your this scheme. Is a, it depends this is a great scheme, benefit. <laughs> if I look up in, uh, you know, uh, Peston and Schroeder or any book, you find they've got these miserable Z2 sitting all over the place. <laughs> the 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 and you're saying you don't need that. No, no, no. Why don't they tell Peston and Schroeder they shouldn't have done this? But that's not what I'm saying. Again, these diagrams, you can be extra careful and just multiply everything with Zs and renormalize. Eventually, this will be on shell massless atoms. So I will not really have to care what's going on with those guys. I will not have to renormalize anything except the distribution amplitude for Romanism production. And renormalizing the, the, yeah, that's kind of a fight. If you have in, masses outgoing on shell particles, bubbles, that's like medium. This on the no, no, but that's medium. Like that's a massless out, a massless. Outgoing particles mean is there's no pole. Yes. You can't get an outgoing right. particle mass. It's the whole issue of even in electrodynamics. You know, people in the old days used to say, well, electrons don't exist. They always have a cloud of gluons. There is no electron pole. Right. There's no electron. Oh. I'm, I'm taking a simpler case electrodynamics. Yeah. There is well, no well. electron pole in any S matrix element. The electron is a sophisticated object. It's not a part, it's not a, 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 a particle theory. It always comes along with a series of with with photons. This is the same with gluons. There is no on shell quark amplitude. It's infinite. It will be an on shell. Sudikov. Sudikov kills the elastic amplitude. Oh, elastic. Yes. Well, that's on shell. It's elastic. Oh, you're saying amplitude. that he needs to emit the gluons as well. You see, if I you go to higher order, if you yeah. try and put that quark and anti quark on shell. In higher orders, you'll get zero from the virtual corrections. You have to always, you, you have to always let it take it plus and minus going to mu plus mu minus into one. This is the sum I did to Mr. They have to go to that to zero. And they will find the exact result. Or they have to show 
Le dei sono le ultra mai da vedere se ha assunto il tipo di remunerazione che vuoi fare. E dei sono le due anzi si ha per il signor choice is dimensional location is blind to the infrared and ultra wide. They don't know what is what. You see, I, I think Giovanni is not quite right. You see, I, I think, think it through, and if you're really right, I think it would be worthwhile writing a paper saying that you don't need the concept of, of uh, wave function renormalization in the, in the renormalized Lagrangian. If the chemo sheet of blah, 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 theorem is applied. Well, no, no, this is, a, this is a, a question of renormalization. If you can do a renormalization prescription, you can write a renormalized Lagrangian. You can throw away all these C2s and C1s just automatically. You don't ever need them in your Lagrangian. You, you, you've saved us a lot of trouble because we don't even have to use Wardadenes anymore because the, the, the Z2 and the Z1 factors, the color terms don't even appear. It's, it's going to make renormalization much, much simpler. And I say, the problem with that is internally in a graph, if you have a vertex like that, you don't have this cancellation because it's off shell internally in a graph. Yes, so, uh, uh, you should, uh, again, uh, you, know, if you, should write, you, you should write this paper and simplify all the miserable renormalization <laughs> that many of us have gone through. I mean, the case for, for the on shell outline particle, massless work is shown here, is it not right to say that it means the you're going to get zero? Whichever way he wants to interpret it. Again, so I think so the technical is to get anything other than zero. P squared, so P is the momentum of the board. P squared is zero, so I'm not sure massless core. So the diagram has. Uh, so so come on, if you just calculate this with an on shell quark, you get zero. Yeah. If you calculate it with an off shell quark and try to take the limit where you go on shell, then you can get zero. I don't think yeah, 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 I completely agree. agree. You see, that's right. This is, a, this is, this is a, an evaluation of one point in an influential phase space. If you were to evaluate this off shell, so you find a singularity, you find a one, not a one over p squared pole in this external line, you find a one over p squared, depending on exactly how you say it, one over p squared to the one minus epsilon. But you can't go to the pole, you can't pick up the pole there anymore. But why do you want to do it this way? Uh, no, so I have a related field question. Theories, field theories are off-shell discussions. Field theories are things that exist off-shell. If you're, if you're trying to live only on matrix, you're doing S-matrix theory. And, you, and if you use S-matrix theory, I agree, you never so, have to talk so about the off-shell object. I'm trying to remember, it's a little complicated. So suppose, um, suppose you square this amplitude, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, so you have a cut quark line. Yes. And you can have I'm gonna draw something, and I'm not getting excited or anything. I'm just trying to <laughs> you don't even sound excited. Oops, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. sorry. Oh, okay, uh, and that's, oh gosh, I used to know it. So, okay, so you produce some quark, right? And you cut it, and you wanna put one loop correction. So you can have virtual corrections like this. Yes. And uh, like this, and of course the other side, right? So you sum this up, and then you remember Kapkowski rules, and you remember that all this together can be written as imaginary part, okay, agreeing that we don't cut through the blobs of uh, this process, right? And Loosely speaking, it's kind of obvious that this gives you the uh, z factor. No, yeah. uh, uh, on a, on a, you have no, z z two Right. So, and then, then you kind of take the imaginary part, and it's sort of less obvious to see that, of course, the equality holds and on this side. This, it works, but in the end of the day, you really take the C2, right, and you split it into the square root of C2, right? So this, this does work. So what is the objection? Well, I think you see, if you, if you take this, if you take this graph before you put the cut, and you have some momentum transfer going through, some P squared. Where you, where you cut, call right, it so, line so, P. Call uh, it line this P. point, by the way, this is all shown. Good, good, good. Right. If, if that, if, yeah, if, right, in, in, in that function, after you've, after you've uh, summed many graphs, uh, you'll find that that function uh, it, it doesn't, doesn't have any, 
doesn't have any pull anymore. So, uh, so suppose there's not some kind of finding going on. Is there all the correction? Well, no. You have to do all the you have to do all the corrections. This 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 p squared is going to resum into a p squared to the one one over p squared to the pole. There's a pole over. If you take the imaginary part naively, you would get uh, an imaginary part would be a delta function. That would be from one over p squared uh, one over p squared plus i epsilon. Mm -hmm. Now, one over p squared plus i epsilon in general is going to be one over p squared one over p squared to the one minus alpha times something. Mm -hmm. It's not a pole anymore. Well, but, so are you saying that the equality is not a pole? Because I can do it in the calculation here, and then I'll be doing just the words. Yeah, so, so I have a related question then. So for you, is the up a UV or infrared equation? It's the no, 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 That's no, exactly no, the same no, no. question. The glob is ultraviolet because. I agree. Look, look I agree. if it were infrared, it would depend on non perturbative phenomena. It's right. No, the, the glob does not it's depend on non perturbative phenomena. It's an ultraviolet thing. I, I agree. So that's kind of the point. Either you're saying the glob is your ultraviolet. Yes. So I'm computing those diagrams, putting renormalization here and the infrared part here. Or you're just saying the glob is kind of more on infrared, it's here to cancel the collinear divergences. So I'm setting this diagram to zero and applying the glob here, not here. Okay. That's the exact difference between what we're discussing here and what I'm saying now. I, I think it's probably not worthwhile continuing. Let's not, I don't want to take up all the time because people want to get walk back in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, so, so, what I'm saying is just that, that uh, whether you're in team UV the glob or in team infrared the glob, the only difference is what you're doing with this diagram. If you don't really care and you just put this diagram to zero, your UV can cancel infrared. That's the bottom. Okay, so I cancel my rapidity divergence with GMOC, and now I'm canceling the UV, and I just need to cancel my physical soft collinear and soft and collinear divergences, which is a process dependent type uh, of divergence. So to cancel that, I will be uh, first a finite cross section, so for exclusive digest production, and then um, a finite amplitude for low L production. So uh, digest production. Uh, that's again a friendly reminder that since the Wiener function was discussed last week exactly for this process, it's a reminder we have the analog corrections to this process. So, anyway, uh, I do have soft and collinear divergences, and those are the ones which you should be most careful about because it means that your process is not a physical process if, you're, if you still have those. So, the physical observable here is not partons, I have jets. So I have to define what a jet is to get rid of those soft and collinear divergences. So what I'm doing here is the simplest thing, just, just for canceling divergences, I'm using a jet cone algorithm. So if I have two partons, uh, I'm defining some cone in terms of uh, rapidity difference and azimuthal angle difference, and defining some cone width this way. If my cone width is smaller than a typical jet cone, I'm saying that these two partons form a single jet. And just doing that, saying that I'm observing jets with this algorithm taken into account, I will cancel my soft and collinear divergence. So I'm left with just soft divergence and collinear divergence. Uh, in the real emission, uh, I just have to say, even though those expressions are all complete monsters, but uh, for the soft and collinear divergences, you recover the usual squared iconal current or uh, the clap emission current. So this is a familiar thing, even though we're using this involved shockwave for reason. And just combining those two guys with the virtual divergences, I'm left with something finite. Um, so any dependence on one over epsilon is canceled between each other, and any dependence on my uh, K plus regulator alpha is also canceled. Just by combining virtual and real, and again saying that my virtual UV can cancel infrared from the real correction because I'm not using that. Can I ask a slight question? So, mm -hmm. what is the calculation? Cross section for integral product or on basic product? For the moment, that's digest. Yeah. Ah, sorry, my, my layout was confusing. I should have put this part here. But I lost everyone. <laughs> well, anyway, so this is still digest. So, I'm observing jets. And, okay, for that, I will uh, construct a finite cross section. So, exclusive diffractive cross section. There's something you might be interested in here is that. <laughs> Since it's exclusive, I'm not uh, adding gluons if they are not soft nor collinear. So I have a soft cutoff here, E, and a collinear cutoff, R, which is the jet cone. 
And so this means that this is log of a collinear cutoff times a soft cutoff, times the log of a soft cutoff. That's your Sudak of double loss. That's what you want to exponentiate eventually. But apart from these logs, which might need some more careful treatment, my cross-section is perfectly finite. Completely generic uh, kinematics, just rigid reboot and exclusive digests with possible saturation, because I'm using the short reference. So for that, that's a result. And that's something which would be interesting to use for the EIC, because again, at the EIC, this process exactly proves the Wigner function in the dipole. And who remembers about jet cone in this? Or? Uh, the collinear log. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, that was for an aerodai jet production. Now, to be also consistent, I will construct a finite amplitude. So the exclusive diffractive row measurement production. So if you're at twist two, it's kind of easy. You can just take your open pattern production and put these guys uh, collinear to the row measurement. So the quark will have X, XP and the anti-quark will have X bar P. I don't have to be more involved than that at twist two. So I'm just taking my leading twist matrix element, uh, writing it in terms of uh, distribution amplitude, and with the collinear kinematics here, I'm just performing the convolution in X space, so the longitudinal fraction of the quark. So my impact factor is doubly factorized. I have the dipole, so the off-diagonal dipole matrix element in the T channel, and in the S channel, I have my distribution amplitude for the raw measure. Now, uh, since this is a singlet to singlet transition, I don't have real corrections to control my divergences. The only thing I have is the ERBL evolution equation. And interestingly, the only divergence you have to be careful about is this guy. You have, if you, those two lines are collinear to each other, this is exactly a collinear divergence diagram, right? So uh, to get rid of this collinear divergence, I'm, again, I'm canceling a UV with the infrared, uh, the infrared by UV, because I'm renormalizing the bilocal operator which enters my vacuum to meson matrix elements. And the renormalization of this guy gives me a counter term. So taking the convolution of the leading order, uh, the leading order impact factor times leading order uh, distribution amplitude gives me a counter term from this renormalization here, which is given as the convolution of uh, the distribution amplitude and the ERBL kernel. Uh, in our renormalization scheme, we want it to be consistent, so we still derive the ERBL evolution equation with our cutoff plus transverse dimension uh, uh, regularization, and you can show that this kernel here acting on the test function is exactly the same as the usual plus prescription ERBL kernel. So even though we have kind of a weird regularization scheme, in that case, the ERBL kernel is exactly the same. Why weird? What? It's not weird, but again, I'm breaking rotational invariance. The, usually you just use four-dimensional uh, dimensional regularization, okay. and then it's easy to get plus uh, prescriptions. Here you have this alpha cutoff on K pluses. Oh. That's unusual in polynomial factorization. So I to be consistent, we derived it, but of course it doesn't have to be different. It would have been surprising if it was different. I you just that that you want to reproduce it, like something like all the very complete. The integrals would probably look like this. So really they probably would, but I, I, okay, I use covariant perturbation. Yeah, same for me. But so, but. Uh, uh, why is the color? Color shows just alpha dependence, essentially. Yes, so you have theta functions and you have a log square. And basically, if you're just saying that I'm multiplying this by phi of z, and that phi of z is phi minus phi of zero plus phi of zero, you can isolate the alpha dependence in phi of zero terms and they will cancel this alpha dependence here. So eventually, just this guy, this guy, and this guy combine into a plus restriction, and which is the usual, completely standard ERB curve. So now, uh, taking those guys, putting them collinear, and adding the ERBL counter term, I get something which is perfectly finite at NLO for exclusive longitudinal measurement. So again, I have a perfectly finite amplitude this time, and you can do some phenomenology for that. And question, where did this uh, death cone disappear? Uh, I'm sorry, I, my talk is a bit confusing. I, I already have to add some transition slice. This was for digest yeah, production. Yeah, this is room after that you put it into wave function of the yeah? 
Well, so now he's switching to roles. I'm switching to roles now. I'm too disorganized. I'm sorry. It's this is just pure role. There's, there's no digest. There's Look no digest. At the top problem. of the screen, there was this topics about digest, and now he's producing the role. Right, but uh, calculation is different. Yes, you're calculating uh, it again. You don't use previous results. I'm using the open portal results, <laughs> the virtual corrections to open portal. I'm just putting those guys, Corinne, or your previous result and put it in the way function, attach it to a function of I'm, I'm, I'm not know? using a way function, I'm using Corinne factorization. I mean, uh, like one way function. So. Distribution of it. No, uh, why not take a previous result, multiply by psi at that point, psi bar at this point? Ah, you want to try that. Uh, well, again, you would have a divergence in this guy. Yes. Well, probably you would have to renormalize the way function. Yes, yes, yes. And I don't know how to do that. And Maybe make, some people do. We may have this problem at some point because it could be. Okay, I, I no, don't no. know how to answer that because I, I'm not aware of an evolution. You, you, what you are calculating really here? What is the vertex? So and for here, again, you just take open parton and put this guy on the mass, mass shell, and here the vertex is just gamma plus, that's gamma minus. Did, sorry. That's what you did in the previous. There was a mass shell force here. Yeah? Yes. Right. No, so my first result is open pattern. With open pattern, you can build either digest production, forget about digest, or this part of the, you can do row. This part of the calculation is the same or not? Yes. And then, why you cannot use it? Why you do calculation again? Because you have to convolute with the distribution amplitude, first of all. And second, since this is gamma is singlet and rho is singlet and this is exclusive diffraction, your singlet in T channel, you don't have room for real corrections to that. So the cancellation is completely different because you don't have any real corrections. Just multiply. Uh, take, take, take single part of the previous result. Uh, what previous result? <laughs> what do you get for production of two quarks? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm taking the production of two quarks. And again, I'm convoluting that with the distribution of it. Okay, so your message is this was factor, jet cone or whatever. If you take singlet. No, no, but forget, forget, the forget way, jet cones. Yeah? Forget hmm? jet cones. I'm not using a jet cone. This is raw meson production. He, not he wants <laughs> you to man, he wants you to start with <laughs> your <laughs> jet calculation. I am interested in how it is. He yeah. wants to take your two jets and well, so then, them into a wrong then the answer is simple that uh, since I don't have real corrections, I don't have a jet cone because the jet cone is applying to real corrections. Uh, it's because I take singlet, yes? That's all because uh, of that. Since it's singlet, uh, well, yeah, exactly. Oh, the right, quark so anti quark yeah. state is singlet. But yeah. you're going to have higher twists, right? Yeah. You yeah. will have oh, a new one going to your. If you're going to higher twists, which I will mention in a minute, yes. yes. You will so have there you would have the yes. Some, yes. some leftover of jet. See, the, the, five, the five parallel, is that the, what is the five parallel? That's a twist to a uh, uh, distribution amplitude for rho. So for the row. Row. For row. For row. And, but that's on, that's on shell. That's on shell. Well, I don't no, know what you mean by on shell. This is variable there. Is it on, are you integrating the quark lines off shell or just on no. shell? Ah, so so what, once it is a wave function, which you integrate over all Over sizes. KT. Yeah, but otherwise it's like a light cone wave function. So this but, and it's an on mass function. shell, but off energy shell, I guess, right? Well, uh, is is that true? But he it's, doesn't like confirmation. In, in collinear factorization, the quark and the antiquark are collinear to the meson and on shell and massless. In, in the traditional wave functions, that that's not true. It's a traditional. I agree. Say, say I agree. Say I agree. Say I agree. This part. is collinear factorization. That's right. Well, that's a collinear factorization doesn't get you. On mass shell in, in, in general, I don't quite understand. It gets you collinear, and since you're neglecting the mass of the meson, you're collinear. You have the same momentum, so your your momentum squared is still zero. So you're saying you can get a result without er, 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 for a row meson without ever knowing an off shell wave function of the row. So the only in, the only information you need about the row is an x dependence, but no off shell dependence whatsoever. Well, this guy contains a decay constant, for example. So that would be no, the process. There's no off-shell dependence whatsoever. It's a one-variable function. At twist two, it's a one-variable function, and nothing is off-shell because you factorize it, right? That, that's the whole point. See, in fact, you know, Brodsky and the Posh factorized too, but they were off-shell. Yeah. So yeah. how do you define? Could you could you write, could you remind us the definition? Come on, zero, so, side bar. 
they think psi rho. No, maybe, maybe, maybe. Whatever. But it's in x space, right? So you have to do some integrals. No, no, no. Well, integrals, yes. All the time, of moment of physics. So, what's the So, long as an argument in P, psi bar, psi moves to have different communities. Psi is zero. But that's not on the show. That's a sum shell, yes. Then and performing the twist expansion of this. And this oh, is sorry, what is the this, 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 this is in coordinate space, and Z is what? Z is it's coordinate. It's a longitudinal transfer. No, it's the full length. No, it's just the longitude. Four dimensional Z? You may so, say so. Uh, no, you call this. If you want so to you're to taking the line. limit where the vacuum distance here, so this distance, this square, is going to zero. That's how you're performing the twist expansion. So you are left with... Then, then there are no logarithms at z squared? You don't take the z squared, that would be a twist four correction. No, no, wait, but I agree when take z squared small, and we're going to take the dominant term z squared, but it, usually what happens, there's a, a, a leading term, say, a z squared, there's all sorts of logarithms of z squared, powers of logarithms. These are coming, these are the anomalous dimension terms. Oh, I, you, you say in that thing you have no logarithms of z squared? In your leading term? No, this is given by the solution of the ERBR evolution. So, probably in that sense, you have z squared. Yeah. But what I'm saying now is. No, it's not z squared. It's z squared and a z squared log, a log, a log, a z squared log of z squared and a z squared log log to the third of z squared and a z squared log z squared, squared times z squared. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. well whatever, your, whatever your factorization scale is. Yes, I missed that. So but that's the only but there are traditionally, see, that's only evolution. You don't get those in, in the. Let me put it in another way. You're saying that you have naive dim anomalous dimensions here that you never get logarithms. Well. So yeah. you're doing the operator product expansion of letting z go to zero. Yes. And naively, you don't have logarithms. You just get a certain power, which are the naive dimensions. But we know that when you do a, a, a more complete calculation, uh, there are logarithmic terms coming from anomalous dimensions of those operators. But that's the so ERBR. That's part of the evolution. Uh, but but, but what's, what I'm but the evolution doesn't affect how you're coupling to the half path. And the way you're coupling from the half path is regardless of the Vivian Bauer expansion of this guy. Where are those logarithms in your calculation? Where are those logarithms in your calculation? Well, they are, they are here. But, the, but that's only a function of x. After I'm using ERBR, it's a function of x and the factorization scale. That's how you get the logs. Because you're renormalizing this guy. Once renormalized, you're choosing a factorization scale of u square, and that's giving you a lot. Okay. But as, as for the coupling to the half part, it doesn't change anything to have lots of logs. Well, are you afraid that you will do some double count? No, no, I, I, I'm just worried where are the renormal, see, all wave functions, the exclusive wave functions, they all have series of logarithms. Well, we know and I'm worried where are those logarithms in this form? In here. Yeah, well, where else that, that phi there is the same as your phi parallel that you want to express it. So that phi parallel is the solution of the RBL. So that would be, once you evolve this guy, you get this. And, and that's the one you should convolute with your yeah, half yeah, part. Exactly. Exactly. The phi okay. okay. parallel is kind of the bare phi, okay. and this is the real normalized phi. Yes, sure. Yes. Yeah, if you uh, want to be pur purist, the mu square, yes, it mm -hmm. merge to what? Well, for di, yes, it's just q squared. No, no, yes, but here, uh, that's... Uh, what, what do you mean here? So in the big formula before that. Oh, uh, here? Yeah, yeah, where do you merge? Well, for the moment, I, I do nothing. Then I'm applying ERBL, and this ERBL, is so this from this uh, evolution you get a one over epsilon tau plus a log of mu f square over mu square. So it will be eventually the same q square, yes, of the incoming protocol. So eventually mu f is yeah, that's q square. That's your hard scale. Yes, but before it so becomes so q square, it's just a with some merge it with some ultraviolet, uh, not ultraviolet, but with some terms in the coefficient. Yes, so return this will give you the return to previous, okay? Yeah. So there is log of mu square here, which should become log of q square. But how it becomes, some be, should be something here, which has log q square divided by mu square, and they cancel it, everything is fine. Right, right. That's yes, right. yes, 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 that, that's it. Well, you don't have log q square over mu square to this okay. my log. You have to. What you have is 1 over epsilon minus log of mu square, the dimensional mu square, which would just combine into that guy. 
I don't, I'm not sure you have a lot of new work from the so yeah, Otherwise, it's, I mean, all right. You have no, logs. probably. I just have to check my paper if again. You go to, if you go to coordinate space, you have logs of mu squared times the dipole size, right? Probably. Not, yeah. not, yeah, really, yeah. not directly q squared, but dipole yes. size. Yeah, probably. But anyway, I'll have to look into my paper. But the whole point is just that this is a counter term, and eventually your only dependency is on new f, and that's where your logs are. No, you're right. I'm, 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 I'm but it doesn't change how it couples to the half path, and by coupling to the half path, it makes the partons unshell and collinear. Unless. Okay, so for longitudinal row, you get a completely finite amplitude. And you can, again, build non perturbative matrix element and convolute and do some phenomenology for that. And interestingly, with all these evolution equations and scales I, I introduced, just have to remark that uh, you can change any of those scales. And changing any of the scales will lead to a next to next to leading contribution. So in that sense, everything is nicely scale independent as one would want. Right? Even if you set the factorization scale to be different from the renormalization scale as in before. Okay, uh, there are two, two questions I would like to answer now. How you get the BFKL limit at next to leading log for diffraction? And what about endpoint singularities? So first, uh, if you're doing diffraction, BFKL and, and shock waves contributions are completely different convolution. BFKL convolutes the impact factor with region fields. GMOC convolutes the wave function with dipole operators. Those are very different uh, objects, right? So I have to see how you define a region in the dipole scattering uh, operator. And the standard way to do that is to use Simon's paper and just define one region field as the logarithm of a Wilson line in the adjoint representation. If you're doing that, you can expand any of your Wilson lines in terms of region fields. The interesting part is the main difference between expansion of Wilson lines in gluon fields and in region fields here is path ordering. So again, uh, one region is the same as one gluon. If you're not doing diffraction, the matching is very easy. You just set that to be one, well, one gluon in the amplitude, one in the complex conjugate amplitude, and you're fine. Do that for diffraction and you're into trouble because, and that's a well-known result from the, from the dipole uh, community, uh, if you want to match BFK, you have to take two dipoles, but also the cross plane. So you have to somehow un-time order your Wilson rings, and that's the standard way of doing that. So if I'm defining these regions fields this way, they are truly regions in the sense that these fields, uh, if I take one and act with the Jimo Hamiltonian, they are regionized. If this formula is correct on the incoherent uh, gauges, like Feynman gauge, because otherwise it's not gauge. I mean, if you go to light light gauge, it's not correct. What's not correct? The formula, it assumes that uh, gauge transformations, gauge rotations are the same on both ends. Yes, but when you go to light light gauge, you are doing rotation. Your, your Wilson line is not the gauge invariant object, right? Yeah, sure. So to, to make this gauge invariant. No, no, this calculation. No, I, mean, the gauge invariance, I know the calculation. Sure. I always thought this something like log. Uh, hmm. But I never dared to say it because it is true only in Feynman. Uh, that, that's Feynman. the way I'm defining a region. I'm not saying that this is the the yeah, region. I'm defining the object from field theory. Well, so then my definition let is. Let me ask you about the gauge transformation properties of R. Simon, on that question, answer very simple. I will only consider the gauge transformation which are same at both ends of infinity. I ask okay. you this question. Uh, well, but that means that uh, to go ahead, you need only to use some specify some covariant gauges. You cannot go to light light gauge with this. Okay, well, I don't have any answer to that. What I'm saying is, for the moment, I will just trust Simon on this one. Are you doing calculations finally? Mm -hmm. No, I'm always in light gauge. But I, everything is gauge independent anyway, right? But yeah. then be careful. I... Well, Okay, um, let's say I'm just trying his formula. I'm not yeah, saying so it's necessary. So I want to get the project time. So the field is not an AI, it's an A plus or an A nine. Well, maybe, but what kind of gauge rotation do you allow here? You mean red, redundant gauge transformation? The field, yeah. the field is vanishing. It's not a light from your age field. It's not an AI. The field is vanishing at most plus minus B. Uh, I understand this. So then I understand this. 
As long as they don't generate any yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you just impose that the, the field remains zero at plus minus infinity to get the gauge transformation. Yeah, you, you can use that with just residual gauge invariance, right? Well, otherwise, I don't have any answer to that for the moment. Let, let me just say that's what I'm doing, right? I'm just warning that this oh, formula okay, okay, okay. is uh, restricted, uh, how to say, yes, uh, okay. the calculus. So, for example, in this, in the another actual gauge, log of u is just zero. No, okay, this is built in to be just using like on gauge. Are you sure this only not, there is one gate when this is crazy, yes? When you, uh, well, there is no use in life. Are you sure that this is the only gate that, uh, where it's crazy? Because you know, everything I was discussing this morning, both me and Thomas, were using the life condition of the project now. Yeah, well, we, 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 we did the same. Yeah. No, that's only the thing. Yeah. Of the, the only thing there is from the target is the use of life, because that's a very specific gauge choice. That yeah. The target only has. Yeah. The target only has to use in life. So in principle, you probably want to put some at infinity, some transverse links. Sure, but that would be an issue here, right? right? This will kill that. But this type here, is defined, you might also is defined, of course, as, a, as not just as, right, people usually write towards the lines, but what they really mean is yeah. links. With the links. Yes. yes, but if you have one Wilson line, you have to have links probably going off to transfer some things. Uh, you need to understand what you are doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say I'm expanding two Wilson lines. And we'll see. Well, well, yeah, the point is this works. So, in a way, she's probably right. I just wanted to. No, oh, okay. I, I will trust you in this one. Yeah, I will uh, also trust Simon here that it works for the moment. Then, if we ever encounter an well, issue. I have the idea. That it will correct disturbance between all calculations of Karchensky and Sadi in the third order. Because. No, okay, in the third order. Yeah. Okay, I'm not going that far. I understand. There is a problem. It, it, but next one, I assume that Reggie uh, cuts anyway. Right? Your regionization in the third order. There is calculation by Fadin. Now, Simu is claiming he actually solved that issue with Reggie cuts, right? Who? Simu. And what, he, what is his uh, message? Uh, his message is using this, you're getting rid of regular cuts. I don't know the details, I don't know anything about this subject. I'm just saying that's his claim. Okay. At next to next reading, but maybe in an equal form. What was the problem again? Regio, Regio, Gluon, Projector. Gluon, Projector. Gluon, Projector. In the third order, there were two calculations by Fadins, direct calculation of the diagram, and by Karchensky from two Wilson lines. Which he projected on TA simply. So he was calculating trace oh. at TA UX. Yes. And I always have a suspicion that instead of calculating TA of UX, if you take log, you will reproduce final result. But, uh, but they disagree. No, they agree. Uh, who? Karchensky. <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, I, I mean, the uh, they say maybe. Uh, <laughs> Oh, the problem is that no one knows that they agree. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe Simon knows. I don't. No, what is the problem? Calculate. I mean, uh, you need three, three loops. It's not a small. Even thing. they haven't finished. They finished. <laughs> no, no. There are two different calculations. One, one so probably one calculation of radius uh, projector is probably like that because diagrammatically. What they know what they are doing. They are taking into account only commutators. Yes. It looks like this expansion. But Karchensky did a different thing. He tried, he took trace of T A and U. No, I understand what you're saying, but did they get the same range of Of course no, that's a problem. They, so they disagree. <laughs> the they disagree on the I mean they uh, they disagree on what, what Karchensky calculated is really Gluon trajectory. That's what they did. This. So they get different answers. The question is, are they calculated? Yes, but you said that I can't believe you. I can't be calculated with something a little bit different. I see. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I will trust Simon and I will trust you that there might be some issues, but for the moment that's all I need. So I'm expanding this dipole in regions with regions defined this way. And again, for just two, two region exchanges, just saying that the dipole dipole also has to be crossed to get full BFM. 
that's an old resort. I think Navarre and Warren. But what do you mean by first? So I mean dipole dipole scattering. If you're just looking at take <coughs> dipole wave functions and two gluon exchange, if you want to match exactly the the VFK or kernel, you have to consider the like time ordered exchange, but also the cross exchange of the Just crossing. Yeah. 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 So you have to unpath order the Wilson lines, and intuitively, at least up to three regions, this is what you're doing. <coughs> but for you mentioned it. Yeah, that's for a diffraction. That's why it's interesting to me, because otherwise that's the same. You just take one and whether it's a gluon or a region doesn't matter. If you're in diffraction, oh, two regions is not the same as two gluons. You're saying when two gluons in a color offset, of course you need the cross integration. If you calculate the cross integration, Yeah, that's the whole point. In BFKR you have just two regions. You don't have cross regions, right? To calculate the initial condition of dipole dipole scattering, you recover the log of BFKL, yes. and then you still have to consider the cross, like we did. In yes, in dipole dipole. If you're using BFKL, you're computing each particle to region vertex independently and then putting them together. So you don't have crossed region uh, propagators in BFKL. No, okay, because in the, if, if you calculate, you have a cross tidal filter cross, and then when you then you have two gluons. You have two gluons when you have to No, you have, you have these cross diagrams in the regularization term, but they eventually regularize into one region, which is not crossed. That's the point. But I mean, yeah. if it's on a singular, I mean, in an octet, of course, if this is an octet. In the octet, in the octet in then for regularization, this is essential. Yeah. But for the singular, I mean, the amplitude is completely imaginary, so this you can cut this, the cut of this. No, but you're passing. So the amplitude is imaginable because, because of the cancellation between those two graphs. That's right. You need to pick yeah. the poles. Yeah. 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 Right. So. But anyway, I'm not even touching those. I'm just saying, if you want to match the impact factors for diffraction to wave functions in in, their, in a configuration theory, the so matching from BFKL to BK is not as simple as just saying this guy is equal to this guy, because if I am performing the expansion of my dipoles here. Uh, in region fields, the convolution of my wave function and the convolution with uh, region fields are very different. One diagram in shock waves or dipoles is four diagrams in BFKL. That's what I mean. That this blob here, which is just a shock wave on the quark, shock wave on the anti quark, actually takes into account all four possible contributions in BFKL with region. Yeah, you just expand it with some and two into region approximately. Regions. At the order of two, it doesn't matter. The order of two, it doesn't matter. At the order of one, it doesn't. But this no, is the amplitude yeah, level. Yeah. Yes, but you see, that's just giving you the gluon distribution, right? And, and when you're doing diffractive mode production off the target at the leading twist level, you know, you know the answer, if it's forward direction, you know the answer is, is the gluon distribution. And so the, this is, that's all this is giving you, the two gluon ex, uh, exchange is, is giving you the, the leading twist gluon distribution. Mm -hmm. Yes, as the unintegrated PDF, as in action of two regions on the target field. You can use regions if you want, but you don't. Yeah, but the next reading log, I think it won't matter eventually. This is the you don't have to ever use regions. You can always use gluons. Yes. Well, I'd rather always just use dipoles, to be honest, but the point is now too much. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all in agreement there. The <laughs> Yes, but not path ordered. That's no, very no, important. You don't count path ordered because you get exactly those dipoles. Oh. So, what you're saying is if you have a time ordered, you draw all the diagrams. If you just write this, then it's like cut. Yes. No, no, no. Like cut, uh, draw yeah. cut diagrams. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. No, you would also have crossed terms, which you don't if you have regions instead of gluons. That's the point. In BFKL, you would always split these into a photon to region vertex and the, and the region to meson vertex, right? And the vertex don't talk to each other. They don't have a crust. You really have vertices. So in BFKL, you would have Photon to region and region to row, but no crossed region to whatever and region to whatever. There's no cross term in the FKL for diffraction. I know that to get the photon impact factor for the FKL, we did exactly that as possible. To get from. In gluons or in regions? In gluons. 
Oh, you see, Giovanni, you see what they're doing. In gluons, you have two diagrams. We have, we don't, and, and that we didn't have any color. No, but yeah. effectively you can write those two diagrams yeah. because one diagram is a cut. I think that's what he's No, but that's the, okay, okay. You're again, you're computing inclusive DIS. Yes. Yes. Of course you don't have this kind of weird cross terms in inclusive DIS. I'm talking about diffraction. That's my amplitude, it's not my my cross section. And the fact that you don't have cross term is because you're defining gradients as no path ordering. But okay, it doesn't really matter. You could also do gluon expansion and then, but that's kind of a mess of next ordinary log. But anyway, so to match wave functions to BFK and impact factors, that's the expansion you're doing. So one dipole amplitude is actually four in diffraction for BFK. Or eight if you want cross terms, but that's okay, it's different. Now, anyway, at leading log, the matching is perfect if you're doing that. If you're not doing that, the matching is not perfect at all. So just matching phi of q1, p2 to phi of q1, q2 in the FKR completely fails. So this is important already at leading log. Well, if you want to compare your impact factor, which you computed in in, uh, in the shockwave framework, yes. to a BFKR impact factor, yes. you cannot just say, I'm taking this impact factor and this should be this BFKR impact factor. Because of this expansion, you should match those. If you're used to BFKR, in BFKR, so that would be the regional momentum. So regions are carrying, carrying Q1 and Q2, and, uh, and the impact factor here couples to, let's say, Q1 on the quark or Q and Q2 on the anti-quark, or both on the quark. In BFKR, should satisfy requirement of equation variance. Exactly. So the fact that the dipole here has color neutrality, so if the dipole is, has Z1 equals Z2, it shrinks to 1, this is exactly conjugate to the fact that in BFKR, if one of the region momentum is going to, momenta is going to zero, you get uh, something which is linear in this moment. And that's exactly what you see here. So these two counter terms from the, the expansion of the dipole are exactly what makes your impact factor gauge invariant in the BFKR sense. Take it Q2 to zero here, and you would get zero. While if you just had taken this and say, this is my BFK impact factor, you would not have gauge invariance. It would fail. Nobody does that. Well, you could do that for, uh, I have a point which I want to make from that. <laughs> so, okay, if you're too much BFK at leading log, all you have to do is, is this expansion. That's perfectly fine. If you go next to leading log, we were discussing that with Genesis, after people tortured him for hours, we just went and discussed a bit more calmly <laughs> about <laughs> decided to torture him some more. Right? <laughs> so uh, in BFK or BK, uh, you have always the freedom of what you're putting in the impact factor and what you're putting in the kernels, right? Now, um, if you want to define the kernel in BFK or in BK in the linear limit, in BFK, at least, I know people define that as the action of the kernel on region fields. So your convolution, what you want exactly is, so your impact factor is say for A to A prime and B to B prime, is the action of A prime bar A on region fields. You want L1 or two, kernel of the FKR on two and the impact factor down. And uh, people have been comparing the, the kernels uh, obtained from BK and the kernels obtained from the FKR this way, with the region field actions. And since you have freedom, you actually have freedom on the kernels. And matching the BK kernel and the BFKR kernel, defined this way, uh, you do have a discrepancy. You have a discrepancy because you can always insert an operator here with has no cut, and then your amplitude is unchanged. So there is one change of variable in the, at next to leading log between the, the impact factors here. You have to know uh, how to go from a BK impact factor to a BFK impact factor at next to leading log, and we know how to go from a kernel to a node. This is not. So the question would be for us, someone before, so that was Ivan of Kotsky and Papa, computed that in BFK, rho L at any node, in the forward cache. So if we're taking our result, take the forward limit equal zero, do this expansion at next to leading log, uh, we should have a mismatch between our results and their results, and that mismatch should be exactly that. 
And that would be a very good double check for us, just saying that, well, we're recovering change of variable between BK and BFK at next to leading up. But first you have to perform this, this expansion and define your impact factor with regions, not with diagonals. But the kernel, the kernel also gets rotated. Well, that's the point, yes. But I want to compare impact factor to impact factor. But, but you should also see that somehow their BFKL green function is different from what you would get from but it's yeah, like the same yeah. yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so a consistency check. Right. It's a consistency You're going to do, I'm just saying, it's not. But you're mm -hmm. just going to look at the impact factors and declare it. Well, we know the operator. It is known. It's in Fadin. Oh, okay. so, 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 so the question is just, if I'm I taking see. this and convoluting with the inverse of this operator, do I get the results or do I get some okay, mismatch? So Fadin and company know this operator exactly from comparing. From, from comparing said, kernels. Comparing the green functions or kernels. Yeah, but no one checked that. Uh, for impact factors. I see, okay. And that's for, that's for, for the exclude the forged frag. Because for the uh, uh, inclusive impact frag, we, met, we, we show the what is the operator, and we... Uh, you you show what is the operator to make BK uh, conform no, or invert. We, no, not just. If you read the one which says an event of factor in KP factor equation form, we show how to get exactly BFKL kernel from the dipole Evolution what form of the BFK are going on? The momentum space Complete or one one. The momentum Complete space. or Mebius? The momentum space. The conformal BFK or the standard? The one that by five Conformal, so that's my point. The okay. standard okay. BFK okay. on. Well, is the one compared by five Okay, to, to make BFK conformal, you need two steps. You're inserting two operators. One operator is What is the BFK for you? Is BFK uh, The complete form. With standard, standard. But let, let, me, let me ask something here, because yeah. I understand that you define something, okay, so you have, okay, let, let's call it two different BFTLs, the one of the BFTL of the regions and one which is the BFTL if we expand our Wilson lines to two blue and exchange approximation. Yeah. Because you will have, let's say, the field A, but you find the field R, okay? So, so you should... No, that's be, exactly the difference. No, difference? No, the, I, the, I, I don't know. Let's say some, some people... Sorry, let's okay, say sometimes go, go ahead, I call BFTL by just expanding the Wilson line to two gluon exchange approximation, but I don't define the region field R that you have. Okay. Now, what is surprising for me, because I know the paper of Ian and Giovanni, is that, to, to my understanding, they, they got their full NLO BK equation. Yes. They expand to two gluon exchange, so they expand the use to, to yes. two fields A squared, but they don't define any regions. They take the Fourier transform of that, yes, and they show that the eigenvalue is exactly the same of the NLO BFTL kernel in Fadin and Lipatov, which I guess mm -hmm. it is not about in the conformal form. form. Yeah, on the conformal. Yes. Uh, well, no, this, this matters. Uh, to, to, to go from from the usual BFTL to the conformal BFTL, you need this okay, operator. Okay, I have the kernel. Okay, but fine. I agree. I agree. I agree. So then, okay, yeah, I'm with Giovanni. <laughs> what did you say? What is KDFL for you? The part of the the part of the corner. That would be the theory, you know, yes. the, 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 the BFKL, the one you're just getting without, without yet one. making it conform. What do you mean? Which energy scale goes into your KDFL? So well, is it that, that's where the difference is here. So that's yeah, what yeah, an interesting point. Formula, so for this formula, I don't. I, I think this I didn't always care look at, about uh, that, at the conformal case is just a symmetric energy scale. Symmetric energy scale, the response to conformal. I think. Yeah, we know, so I don't think so. You know. Okay, so, yeah. so I, I think this is. No, oh, this, this is, is what uh, I would not use the word conformal. Right. But, but if I take kernel, and a low kernel, which we calculated with our tricks, which work in an equal to four, and make a forward case. We reproduce exactly symmetric uh, green function of four regions, the part of part. momentum space. Huh? In momentum space. Sure. Yeah. With symmetric cut off. Uh, what else can you. Wait, so you're saying is that, is, for, is that for the inclusive case or. Do you, does your kernel. Is it uh, let me repeat, cut kernel or. Let me repeat the statement. The part of has some formula with the symmetric energy cut off for mm -hmm. the re, uh, green function of two. Yes. Right? Four giants given. Yes. We can reproduce, we, if we take our kernel with our trick, which works in n equal to 4, gives mm -hmm. uh, formally mm -hmm. valid result. If okay. we do the same trick in PCD and make uh, forward, uh, make forward case, 
we reproduce lipatopadian kernel with their symmetric QQ prime, as divided by QQ prime. So that but without are. introducing okay. the concept of energy, like science, like without, without, without yes, introducing, but, that's the point. But again, is it for the cut kernel or the full? How, how, I mean, Take <laughs> okay, the, the, the reason why you need two arrangements in my case is I have two exchanges in the, in the amplitude, but yeah. in the cross section. If you're studying cross sections, so if the cut is between the two region exchanges, then you don't need to do that. So for inclusive DIS, you don't need to define regions because one region is the same as one group. Not for two. Oh, are you telling me that our formula will be not correct if I take my other part? I'm telling you I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to check. I'm not saying anyone is wrong here. I'm just saying. Okay. If we take our impact factor and just compare to their impact factor, it should have a strong mismatch. And that strong mismatch should be first, well, the notion of regions, and second, this. Yeah, that's because, well, uh, fine, but who, perhaps the trick to go from one to uh, another is similar to your trick. No, I'm not saying I it's was true. asking Fagin many times what is exactly energy scale in your non positive scale? And he was always like, <laughs> <laughs> I asked him. <laughs> you mean there's a, a, a zero? Well, in the bottom, forward is S divided by Q, Q prime. Okay. In non forward, what you could. Yeah, why okay, I don't know. Why, <laughs> are, they, why are we talking about non Oh, because you look at non yeah. Yes, I'm in mean diffraction. But anyway, I, I'm just saying, there's they this question which is raised, and apparently it's interesting for people. So, we this introduce some unitary transformation which uh, agrees with us. It says that, okay, I am somehow uh, put some energy scale, somehow, working definition. But then I know this operator, oh, Mm -hmm. Which will restore you. And he did that for conformal invariant for n equal to four and managed to restore conformal invariant. So he has some working definition on this scale. I don't know it, and he, he never told me. Yeah. But, but it's but probably what some. Do you, what do you okay. suspect? It's certainly not going to be momentum transfer anyway. Yes, it's because some, I don't know. It's some working definition. Just, but when you supply right. this working definition by operator Q, you recover uh, conformal invariant at all. It's fine for me. I totally agree. But here you're doing something. Well, maybe the trick is the same. I don't know. Uh, all I'm saying is what I know is this operator that was uh, derived by Vadim Fiore Grabowski. And maybe this operator is the same trick that you did. I don't know. Okay, maybe it is. It in fact we found at the same time. It was in the same And maybe it's earlier. No, they are correct. Okay, I can believe you. I'm just saying that's what I'm trying to match. I'm not saying there are no other objects. Actually, that's what made me suggest Giovanni this problem because Padin was going around and saying that the scale is not compatible with skull formal series in the next Well, that's also why he hired Grabowski to study your paper. Well, I was very unhappy when Giovanni was my student. One of our problems was to. Yeah, so, okay, we have a. Same problem, but apply to a simple process. So oh, um, now everybody is fine. Why do you need this here? Well, because we know our impact factor. We know people have the BFTR impact factor, uh, but the matching is not done because the matching is highly non-trivial, and we know there should be a mismatch. But by this word, FPL, you mean Fadim Fiore Grabowski? No, that's uh, Ivanov Kotsky Yeah. If you take our paper with Giovanni, there is no O. Is it equal to one? For what process are you talking about? No, but oh, no, in your paper, Giovanni, you're, 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 you're performing all these tricks. If and performing these tricks is the same as playing by insertion of uh, yes. If I want to take our impact factor and apply it, so a scattering from large nuclei, say, uh, married to decay, yes, to some solution of decay, I will use our impact factor without any O. Right? Okay, but your impact factor without any O is well, our impact that's factor that's with some yes, O's. Yes. <laughs> that's all. Ah, anyway, so there is this interesting matching which apparently is interesting to other people. <laughs> so now I'm both happy and late on my talk. So the second question would be endpoint singularities, because I've used scolinear factorization in row Wait, are you changing topics now? Or, I, mean, I am what raising the sec No, I'm saying in the future we want to do oh, that. I'm not saying I have an answer to that. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> so uh, second theoretical question is endpoint singularities. 
So I'm, use, I'm doing an operation to rho r production, and there is a factorization theorem at pure collinear factorization, so with a GPD and T-channel, for longitudinal photon to rho meson. The transverse photon to rho meson is not too clear for me whether or not there is a factorization theorem. But you can see here, for example, if you're setting the T channel KT to zero, you see that this XX bar factor cancels the XX bar factor here. In the transverse case, it's not too obvious that you have any such consolation. So you could expect in the collinear limit to have some terms like integral from zero to one of phi of x over xx bar. That's an endpoint singularity, and this completely breaks collinear factorization. So... Isn't the aligned jet configuration? Sorry? Isn't it the aligned jet configuration? Yes. I'm studying yes. also, in some yes. sense, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's, not so that's breaking factorization, potentially. Yes. So for longitudinal raw meson production, this is... Okay, it's easy. Now we restored S-channel collinear factorization by having the shockwave for, for shockwaves in the T-channel. So what's happening if you're going to a process which already never factorizes uh, in collinear factorization, namely rho t production? That's the interesting thing for us. So let's try to restore factorization for rho t, even though it shouldn't factorize in the collinear factorization. Again, this is a non-forward and non-dilute extension of the previous work. Now, uh, in the very beginning, when I started to present the shockwave framework, I said that I have this very nice feature that the recursion for the interaction with the external fields starts as zero. If the shock wave is trivial uh, for lines, I can insert that back here and have that the effective lines have a propagator with one Wilson line, which is a full Wilson line. If you're using fields, as you want to do for rho t, because now the factorization is explicitly with very involved matrix elements in the S-channel, so, so rho, vacuum to row matrix elements, are, have those fields acting there, you cannot do that. You actually, if you're studying fields, you have to distinguish whether or not you're scattering with the, with the target. So you have twice as much uh, diagrams as you should expect. Well, even more than that, actually. So, what I would want to write this very natural dipoles uh, shockwave diagram for transverse row meson production, I actually have to distinguish here because the Wilson line for that guy starts at one interaction with the target. So the, the, the Wilson line operator for this guy is trace one minus one, you two diagram minus one. It has a monopole. It has two monopoles actually, quark monopole and anti quark monopole. Sorry, what's the monopole? Trace of a single Trace of a single line. line. But that's and an I, artifact of the of the nomenclature, right? No, it's an it's just the fact that if you're using shock waves with fields, you have to distinguish. Right, but it's if, not you, that if you if you don't subtract the ones, no, like it's not the, about not subtracting the ones. It's usually you're absorbing this guy here, which you cannot do here. Sorry, which guy? Uh, this bare field, so non-interacting field. So usually, what you're doing is. The way yes, you're exponentiating. Yes, yes. Well, right. is, you are you okay? the one in the Wilson line, but why can't you absorb it anymore? Because it's different. I mean, well, uh, th there are two reasons. Like, like. Uh, you had, okay, initially, uh, the formula is like, you are P, you have a Wilson line propagator, okay? That's the basic uh, so form. So G is a propagator, or Okay, so you produce your particle at some point. This is one, this is one, and you're propagating from the one to the two. Yes. Right? Here you have the shock wave of one, and then zero. If you're setting this shock wave to identity, you have, uh, now, who you transform this guy, that's simple. What you get here is um, u bar p, so you have one of the two plus eventually. Well, anyway. That's one minus p slash gamma plus over two p plus. So you have one obvious discrepancy if you're using field in this term. Because with lines, you could have used direct equation and set that to zero. And in that case, you would recover exactly u bar p. With fields, you get derivative of field. That's not something you're setting to zero. This matters a lot here. So where did this p slash gamma plus come from? Uh, anti-commutation. 
So you have gamma plus and some propagator of Q, let's say. That's two Q plus minus uh, Q slash gamma plus, and that's what you're setting to zero. Usually. That's how you're starting to exponentiate the interaction of the targets. You're starting at one, and then you're saying that you can actually absorb even the zero. Let me ask the question. Yeah. At the beginning, when you use shock wave formalism, that psi bar and psi attached to shock waves, uh, attached to Wilson lines along plus direction. But then you are making, uh, then there is a different light form direction, yes, for the row wave function. For the wave function huh? they prob it's probably I, different. I'm not doing anything with that, and that's the point. The way I'm computing those diagrams, which are not truly diagrams, yes, it will be the one. Romanism wave function is defined on the light form. That light form is different from. from uh, I'm sticking to compute operators. So this is integral d phi of z1. So this is z1 dz2, some wave function of z1 and z2, times rho cyber of z1 and lambda say of z2. And z1 minus z2 square should be small. Eventually, I would say that z1 minus z2 are going to zero and perform by two sixes. Yeah, my question But is instead of doing that and having all these seven distribution amplitudes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just keep those. It's technicality, meaning d1 minus d2 is like, like in which direction? Uh, so, rho plus momentum p and z is just your second pseudo So, once you want to do this uh, collinear extension here, you're just saying that uh, you have two parameters which are not like you have P yes. and you have Z, right? So, well, the, the things you want to construct depend on P dot Z. So you have basically P mu, Z mu times some uh, some distribution. It is the same as direction of the target or not? Probably not. No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Right? The rod is along the photon. The opposite of the target. Uh, but I'm not saying anything on Z. Well, that's going along the direction of the photon. That 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 yeah. right. That that psi psi bar that goes along the light cone of the photon. So it's going along the photon direction. That's the non-local. That's the bi-local operator that appears in any hard scattering. So sorry, returning to my question. So the the, uh, the term uh, minus q slash gamma plus yeah. is that essentially the same thing as the no, it's, it's, a, it's a term you're just setting to zero because it is zero. For if you have a propagator or a line, it's always zero. So it's always zero because you have the Dirac equation. Okay, so then what's it? Then I'm not sure why you. I'm that using fields. So instead of having like u bar q slash gamma plus, I have psi bar q slash gamma plus. I see. So then you That's cannot use Dirac equation to set it to zero. So you can use the direct equation to set it to a three body matrix system, but you cannot set it right. To but right now you use it because you have two. It right now, yeah, I'm just saying this, uh, these are separate terms which I cannot absorb. Eventually I will, but the absorption costs a twist four contribution. That's an interesting part. So if you're doing that at twist four, you wouldn't be able to absorb it yet. Okay, let's move on. So I have my natural two body diagram. Which is uh, this guy times psi bar of z1, psi of z2. But these are not fields anymore. It's a diagram, right? The diagram is uh, that's <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not using distribution amplitudes. This guy has a convolution with psi bar of z1, psi of z2. In the in the non-perturbative vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so that's a convenient way of writing a monster. This is a monster which has an S-channel non-perturbative matrix. I'm just making it compact. Those are all unreadable expressions. But this guy has matrix okay. So you cannot say that this will be just absorbed into a one. No, no, I'm not. You have to distinguish that. I'm just saying that the diagram, I mean, I understand your explanation. Yeah, but I shouldn't be writing diagrams. I should have a blob here and play with that. I should but, so do I understand correctly that your phi is the blob? My phi is everything with the blob included. Everything. But For the moment, I'm not touching my matrix elements. I'm saying this phi here has the matrix element. I should have written a blob, and I apologize once more. I being not here, but this phi is not the perturbative part. It's the impact factor, the full one, with the meson vacuum to meson matrix. Mm -hmm. 
then you don't know it. Well, I will parameterize it eventually, but for the moment I have uh, more yeah. fundamental business to, to address yeah. before doing anything. So I have this natural diagram, and I won't trace you on your diagram. I don't want model plots. And I also have these kind of diagrams where this line does not scatter at all, and this guy has all the scattering, and this comes with an anti clock model. So isn't the total um, result just u1, u2 yeah. minus 1? Yeah, which is what I'm trying to say. That's What's what you that? want. That's what you want oh, that's eventually. That's, uh, it's, in a sense, from graphs, it's, yes. isn't it manifest? That's what I was trying to ask. No, yes, 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 I, I will come to that later. There is a difference between those diagrams. When you show me, you don't need to consider one interact, but no, you have just to show me interact both. That's what you want. That's what you want. If you have lines or propagators, you're perfectly fine. If you have a vacuum to meson matrix element, which involves fields, you cannot absorb that term. So you don't have trace u1 u2 dagger. You have trace u1 minus 1, u2 dagger minus 1, because they both interact Where with what? Where are the fields here? So what do you have to draw what you have I apologize for my question. So the way I'm computing those impact factors, basically, just take the name. Okay, so that's the diagram you want. So this is basically. Oh, that's true. Oh, it's getting dark. That's what I'm calling a diagram. It's not a diagram, it's a vacuum to row meson S matrix, right? So what I'm doing now, you have some kind of hard dish part here, and you're performing a field projection in color space, in spinner space, whatever, and eventually you're left with So where did that come from? You you start with the what do you call that in the full diagram or the distribution matrix? That's the full Transition from vacuum to row in the shockwave bubble. Okay, where is the virtual photon splitting into people right there? You have two propagators on the photon vertex. Okay, so you have one propagator here, so one. And okay. oh, the, the, the sign is a vertex, I'm not sure I'm reading right next to the explosion. Oh, that's epsilon slash. Yeah. Oh, that's epsilon slash. Oh, I see. But why are you minus one and one that pull you? Because again, I, I have fields. These are fields. In the beginning, before you fill, you have the radicals side by side going out of the shock wave. Uh, yes, and and yes, and, and no. Then are because when the propagator starts with u, why u minus 1? Look, that's the point well, that I'm making. It, it doesn't start it with u. It's a field. Here, Maybe if you're looking right. at just a quark, which will enter a blob and start at point z0, z0 being before let on time 0. I'm trying to write this effective sidebar of Z0. And what, what I have. You can, and then you apply LSD. And what I have is that if I want to exponentiate the action with the from the target, I cannot. I can only exponentiate if I have at least one interaction. So you have to distinguish this sidebar of 0 as one term which does not scatter and a term which does scatter. And you cannot absorb y into the other. Why? Because, because well, just write uh, it, and mathematically you will see that uh, this doesn't. You need the particle to be so on the These are the, these are not diagrams. These are fields. That's my matter. point. If, if it does matter. matter. It does matter. You cannot set d slash of psi to zero. You can set. P slash U to zero. Yeah, if you have a diagram, I mean, you have P slash U. If you have fields, you have D slash psi. Yeah, but now how does it to fit with the fact that the propagator of the fields, the field propagator is part as a what to U here, not a U minus one? Well, that's the point I'm trying to make in this section. You have to sum all these diagrams yes, to know. get eventually trace U1, U2 diagram. Yes. But this is only true at twist three occurs. If you want to match, eventually the rest, you will have to be extra careful with those. So let, let, maybe let me go ahead and, and you'll see. Okay? If you use the group, the quark propagation 
and you attach the core propagate, and then to produce a quark, you use a let's see, reduction formula. That, that, that gives you a line. That gives you u bar. Right. That doesn't give you a sign. No, but you can uh, write in terms of uh, uh, you can expand. You you can insert a uh, uh, sign and then uh, take the property. You, you can. You cannot just replace a u bar by a psi, Is what I'm trying to say. Good. Here. You are right, but you can insert uh, psi bar uh, psi bar psi as an operator. Basically, you don't know the operator. But if you knew the operator, you would have just a two point function you stick in your. Well, I know my operator, it's a sidebar, so I don't know why yeah, you I would be playing with that. And put the propagator. That's it. You will not have that minus one ever. Okay, let, let me show it's you it's how it's exactly they are different. Okay. 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 So again, mathematically, just look at that. You will never be able to plug this guy in. Okay. Okay, just do the exercise if you want. I'm telling you. So you have to sum this diagram, which is the natural diagram, but which has monopoles to this guy. And if you're going to the three body contributions, you have this natural three body CGC diagram, but you have to subtract again, each term, the non interacting term. So you don't just have uh, dipole dipoles uh, as you would like, you actually also have dipoles and monopoles in this guy. And very interestingly for me, that's row T, it's leading order. Uh, you have a double dipole term, even though this is a three level computation. At least three, since you have three body contributions, you have double dipoles. So, probably in that framework, you have a good sensitivity to saturation. So, that's interesting. But back to my QCD gauge invariance. So, I have dipole and monopole contributions, but I also have quark gluon dipole, anti quark quark dipole, quark monopole, gluon monopole. And no anti quark monopole because otherwise this would be a non perturbative diagram, which is part of ERBL. But okay, I want to sum all those guys together to get what I would expect to happen in BK. So let's cancel the two body monopoles. Now, uh, again, that's my natural CGC diagram, so the term in which my field uh, scatters at least once. And I, I am isolating this minus one here. Now, I'm Fourier transforming this guy and anti-commuting, as I was saying on the, on the board. What I'm getting here is one term, which is very nice, it's just psi bar of z1, and one term which has a derivative of psi bar. This term with a derivative of psi bar is something I can rewrite from direct equation into a three-body contribution. So this monopole part actually does matter because it gives me a three-body contribution from a two-body diagram. That's very important for the following. Now, this term is still a very nice two-body diagram, and I can add it up to this guy. Now, compare these two people. The one thing you have to know when you're computing those with the, the vacuum to meson matrix elements is that this element at least three doesn't depend on Z plus. So what you are left with is some complete monster with a non perturbative matrix element convoluted with this, but there is one and only one difference between those two guys, and that's the light cone energy generators. So if you're looking at those, so Q is the momentum here. This guy has to, let's say, the normal light cone energy dominator where you have Q squared over 2Q plus. This guy has Q minus equal zero in its light cone energy dominator. So the one difference between those two guys is here, first I'm taking the Lycon perturbation theory, effective rule, uh, denominator, and then I will plug this guy into the ZA to set Q minus to zero. And this guy is first set Q minus to zero, and then I'm writing my Lycon energy denominator. That's the one difference between those two diagrams. At twist three, you can, well, you know that the twist three matrix element is at most linear in Z curve. And doing that, it just means that if I'm summing these two guys, I need this sum and, and its derivative at Q, Q per P equals zero to be zero. That's just, okay, that's just a technicality. But the second derivative doesn't cancel. And the second derivative would happen at twist four. So at twist three, you can always just match those two body uh, monopoles set them to zero, but at least four, you would be in more trouble. Um, okay, that's for the two-body monopoles, right? So I'm just adding those two guys, and up to twist three, I'm all right. 
So these two guys, uh, okay, I have two minutes right here. Uh, this guy is canceled by Yontai Park Monopoly, but I'm left with this guy. Now, for the three body unnatural dipoles and monopoles, I have to cancel all of those because, well, they are not the ones you would write in a natural diagram. So you have all these guys, and you can show similarly to the remark I just did about like on energy dominators that um, those are roughly equal at twist four. So if I'm taking, let's say this guy, the wave function here is the Z1 and Z2 integral of the natural wave function. Okay, so that's what I'm left with. So all of them relate to the natural diagram through integration up to twist four correction. So uh, this means that if I'm just summing all of my uh, three body diagrams, all the unnatural monopoles and dipoles and the natural diagram all together, they are all, you can always factorize this natural diagram and the matrix element is just restored almost up to that. And this is just the sum of these diagrams. And now this is an anti-quark monopole. So if you remember from previously, uh, the two body diagram where the quark does not interact actually has a three body anti quark monopole. And you can show again with the same kind of tricks that this contribution plus the three body from the two body actually sum to zero. Well, sum to CF actually. So eventually I'm just left with my natural monopole, uh, with my natural CGC diagram. But again, that's up to twist four. So what's the advantage of getting there in such a long way? <laughs> well, the advantage is proving that it's right. <laughs> because, well, you're starting from, <laughs> I was proving that this works. That's what you would expect to work works, but it's absolutely not obvious. Why is that even just a cross check? Because again, the effective rules for fields never tell you that this is what you mean. If I would do like that, there's evolution in my time, yes, between zero and Roman. I did first up to uh, like current time zero evolution and the point like current time to zero, I have three shock, three shock waves for the time. Mm -hmm. And then I have an outcome at like current time equal to zero, I have three iterators. So I bar with a touch. Mm -hmm. uh, so like Wilson lines, single Wilson line, and configure, uh, of extra doom. And again, I bar with a touch Wilson line. And now, I need, and it is integrated with some integral for remembers, which remembers about Q. Now I need to use information that Q is large and somehow assume that some of these transfer distances are small. That's mm -hmm. what you are doing. But in this way of doing and assume something about uh, uh, interaction with Romadon. But at this point, quark is all the stuff uh, at the touch plane. There is meaningless to separate it in bad quark and U minus one. I don't understand. It, it, de it depends on which collinear factorization frame you're using. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no. So you is of uh, yes. No, no, when you were no, no, sitting on it. He was trying to hide it. If you were to do like that, then at time, like from time equal to zero, so I will have zero sidebar with its own order of exponential to minus, to minus infinity. And then, if a two, a two quark level, it should be like that. If you have extra room, there will be something probably here, G, and then. Yes, but, okay, uh, then I understand your previous question, and the answer was no. Because, <laughs> well, <laughs> you're thinking of a light ray operator. Uh, I never know. I will think What's the right here? D1 port, D1 port, D2 port, D3 port. Along but which ray? Along which way? The four plus light. Like. Yeah, yeah, that's yes. Yeah, so so that's not the shock wave. Oh, that's shock wave. It's a shock wave. Like so not along the four. Yeah, along the, the target. No, the, the, no the, 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 will, the Wilson lines are along the four plus. Yes, along the four. They pass over a target going in a shock wave coming the other direction. Okay, so okay, 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 okay. Yeah, two point zero. And then okay, there is integral over D G one, D G two, D G three with something which remembers about Q. And now I can use information that this Q is large and assume that you are minus D2 and minus D2 is small, you can expand over this. 
That's probably what you are yeah. doing. Yeah. But so why, that, that's, that's, uh, why that's what you would do in light conferring of authorization. Mm -hmm. The issue is that in that case, you would, get, you would have to compute the derivative of your half point. You will have a term from your Q expansion here, which would give you a derivative of what you have in front of those signs of Yeah, what's wrong with that? Well, it's more complicated in the whatever. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's wrong with that. And so that's the first thing which is wrong with that. And can, again, can uh, I'm doing that at reading order, but the goal eventually is to do the NLL thing. correct. You produce the same result, actually. Well, I never tried your method, I cannot say. So what I say here. How can you say it's more, more complicated? Mm -hmm. No, no. <laughs> I, I can tell you that taking the derivative of the half part if you're going next to reading log is a nightmare because the half part already is a nightmare. And the goal eventually is to go to next to reading log. So now I'm proving my point. I'm building something which is perfectly QCD gauge invariant by using all these methods. This is perfectly fine. And so then I can assume I'm in the Vanzura big check approximation and go to next to reading log from my open bottom production results. But so far, I want to check that what I'm doing actually makes sense. And if you were just writing the shockwave diagram with u and u dagger, instead of u, one, u minus 1, u dagger minus 1, it would not completely make sense because you have twist 4 corrections. And you, I actually wanted to check that all of this is actually true, that uh, all these corrections are just twist 4. That was just the point. And all this trouble is again because you're using fields, because uh, you're using, well, I'm using co covariant. Co I'm prepared to use fields, not yet, but at some point I will. And what's wrong with that writer? I may use a gauge where there is no this attached, all of them are zeros. And instead of G, you have only AI in the, this uh, like, like gauge along that bottom. No, but that's already part of my, of my thing, actually. What I'm Okay, that's something else, but if you're using like on gauge, you have to extract those gluons from, the, from your gauge link, but not the gauge links like Wilson line type of gauge, the, the, the light ray operator of gauge link. Those are completely different gauge yeah, links, right? Gauge and, and this gauge is unrelated because this is something I'm doing already. I'm extracting the gluons from the gauge links, and this is part of my impact factor. But so your light ray form, which you like here, is uh, kind of different because you have separation of scales. You have the Wilson lines in the meson matrix element, and you have the Wilson lines on the target from the shockwaves. And they are completely different. So it's probably not as easy. I'm just doing what you want. Wilson line, on my, if you take, if you will take a gauge from the parallel, which not slide, then what That's you the last one. You will somehow have gauge connections in so this. this so it's not the this will be endpoints, <laughs> endpoint connections. I mean, not endpoint. No, I, I understand what you're saying, roughly, but so yeah, there will be. I, I am not sure. No, no, no. It always happens like that. It, it, you, in the beginning, you have some rules, yeah. And if you use gauge when there is no this field online, what will happen instead of that? You will have some. Um, yes. Okay, but what is happening at the here? What is happening here? Here. Yes. Uh, you need to, uh, to think, uh, I mean, uh, and if you're thinking, you will see, you have a <laughs> minus one and a one. <laughs> <laughs> you, will see, you, will see some, you will see some transverse gauge links here, some transverse gauge links. Yes, but I don't need transverse gauge links here. I mean, I have the, the shockwave gauge links, oh, and I have the longitudinal gauge links. When you go to Romazon, you need to have transverse gauge links, otherwise, uh, or, or gauge links. I have the gauge links in the Romazon. They are taken into account. I didn't write them here. I'm using covariant collinear factorization. That's your formalism. That's what I'm using. Well, we can discuss the details yeah, afterwards. The, the point I'm making now, uh, even though you cannot absorb everything nicely from fields, everything eventually just reduces to what you would expect exactly in uh, standard dipole factorization. You have the dipole here and the double dipole. And for me, this is completely linked to QCD gauge invariants maybe not a trivial way for everyone, but if you're taking those two operators, those two convolutions, expanding those convolutions in region fields as I did before for low L, then this is the BFKR impact factor from those. And you see now exactly that, if you're taking Q1, so the one of the region momenta to go to zero in Q1, you're linear in Q1. You're linear in Q1 here and you're linear here. And same for Q2. 
So in that sense, if the convolution has this form, which is the natural form of the CGC, then your QCD gauge invariant in the BFK sense, and that's my point. I'm restoring, by doing all this business, I restored up to twist four contributions, QCD gauge invariants for those amplitudes. And again, if I'm doing this expansion here, our impact factor from the shock waves actually matches the previous BFKR results. All the two body or the three bodies, I still need to check the three body non three contribution, but there's no reason why it wouldn't work. So again, all this business, which might sound weird, uh, matches the BFK results. And in BFKR, they also had a lot of trouble to check QCD gauge invariance. They also had to somehow absorb the two body into the three body, blah, blah, blah. In the shockwave framework, it's very natural. The two body, the three body from the two body is just a derivative term in a non-interacting part of the gauge. And that's probably my conclusion now. So this kind of messy talk uh, gave you the full computation of two NLO processes. So exclusive diffractive processes, exclusive diffractive digest production, which would probe the Wigner distribution, dipole Wigner in, at the EIC, and uh, NLO correction to low L, which, okay, you can go to the collinear limit and check that these are GPDs, but eventually the GPDs in collinear factorization would not factorize for parts of the process we computed here. So by using small x, we actually restore S-channel collinear factorization. And okay, we also restore QCD gauge invariance, which is exciting for me, but apparently not for everyone in this room. And I think that's all for me. That there's a lot of phenomenology which could be done from these three results, and especially at the EIC. So that was a bit formal, but eventually this will have a consequence. Thank you. Someone else? I don't know. If not, can go to the phone. Yes. 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 Uh, it's kind of obvious that the leading order is still true at the next to leading order because the uh, only in the dilute just, limit. So yeah, only in the dilute limit. Operation. Oh, if you just expand everything in the dilute limit, right? Because yes. right. Well, the if you drop the nonlinear term, next to leading order you have dipole way out. Two Wilson, two four yeah. Wilson lines, and a view on yes. Wilson lines. So it's not you would have a double point. dipole Wigner distribution. But if you're assuming that the double oh, dipole Wigner is dropping. Double well, dipole is a three-point function, right? So yes. in what sense is a Wigner distribution? Well, I mean, it's not like a square over the distribution. Well, in the large MC limit, yes. Well, I'm not even sure, to be honest. No. It's the square of the Wigner operator, but it's not a square. Yeah, in the large MC limit, you have a product of two dipoles, and each two dipole amplitude, you can write as some Fourier transform or Wilson distribution, maybe. So that's your Wigner distribution, right? That's my dipole amplitude, which nowadays. Yes, but this is also a Wigner distribution. What do you yeah. do with the two body? Uh, no, the question is, you want to well, you just, you'll just take large and see limit. That's the one that's in C. Yeah, and C squared. That's a completely different dis distribution. Okay. So you need to drop it somehow. Um, well, but that's what's important at an NMO, but then you drop it. Well, so if it. actually, if that dominates, then your access to linear distribution is gone. Well, yeah. your access to that in your distribution is not gone. So it's no, also no, so in the no, distribution is the first line. The no, that's line dipole line. I mean, it, it, there's a whole set of linear distributions. It's not just one. So no, that's that's similar, you have like Sucker William distribution, and you no, that's, that's just whatever this one. different staples connecting with two points, but you have two points, right? With the distribution, you start with two different points, and you do the standard Wigmanization yes. of a product of two fields. And if you yes, want to make a gauge variant, you put a link. But how does it connect to the second line? How, where, where does well, it come? That's what, right? I don't what know. I'm trying to say, yeah, I don't know either, I'm asking, right? So if, if the, sta the statement, the no. statement that the two-jet produ two production measures with the distribution is obvious at the, in the first line, but it's not obvious in the second line. No, no, I agree. Mean, okay. Saturation so might mess things up. But the point is, if you're well, dropping saturation, it's actually a linear distribution. So if you linearize it again, then? Right? Yes. Okay, so in that sense, so, all right. I so that's what I would say. You have this additional thing, which is the interesting part for us at saturation, but the completely missing part for TMD. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, my so the last question is uh, more philosophical. So 
when you talk about twist three corrections, right? You, yep. You're talking about twist expansion in the row meson. Yes. So you have like mass of the row meson of a Q squared, right? Yes. So your Q squared should be large enough for M rho squared or Q squared to be small. Sure. Um, at the same time, or you have a proton that you scatter on, right? Yep. So you have higher twists on the proton side. Um, so well, this physics is really shock waves. You have infinity. So you to try. Well, shock wave is an approximation. Reality is a proton, right? So yeah, so you have all sure. twists. You have all twists, but it's not exactly all twists, right? It's all the twists which are enhanced by powers of 1 over x. Or in other words, sure. you, you use some no, no, agree, agree. Uh, right. Saturation yes. physics resums corrections on the proton side, which are qs squared over q squared. So okay. the, right, Q squared of X over Q squared corrections. But mm -hmm. iteration physics neglects corrections of the order of lambda squared over Q squared. So the higher twists on the proton side, which are not enhanced for whatever reasons by powers of one over X. They're not accounted Why for- Why are you saying you're neglecting lambda squared over Q squared? You, you're neglecting anything over S, nothing about Q squared. Uh, Why yes, are you saying that? Uh, because if you're using a new model, for instance, right? Yes, but you'll, you'll I'm not using any model for the non-perturbative part here. So fundamentally, no, I don't know. Uh, sorry, what do you mean? Non-perturbative or I'm not. I'm not worried about you. Well, I also have the non-perturbative, the, the shock wave to, well, shock wave okay. field. That's so so if, you use, if you use, as we discussed in the model, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to use big gauge in work evolution okay. to describe your, your small x evolution, you have to assume a large dilute nucleus at the bottom and your and your initial condition would be given by a B model which is neglect which is keeping uh, tracks uh, track of uh, higher twist which are enhanced by a to the one third by the size of the okay. nucleus no, but, but that, it doesn't keep track of, uh, of regular higher twists just which are not but that's not a feature of shock waves that's a feature a feature of the M D model. Well so this part if, which if I discussed is not effective. If you want to justify use of Jim Walk or BK evolution that's an integral part. At least no, that, that's what I'm saying. Again, that, that's that's the clash between I think the uh, Baliski's community and the CGC yeah, community. Like we are small X. We don't right? assume anything on CG uh, on the target side. Eventually, you have to. Otherwise, you never get. Eventually, you have to. But for the moment, I didn't discuss anything about that. Okay. I, so, small so, X. so before before, before, we, before we continue, no, before, I'm, the, I'm saying the issue arises as you're trying to do something else. But for the okay, moment, no, but yeah, I, I understand. This is, I can turn it into a comment. I'm concerned. So if you go to twist three. In your own as on whether you need to revisit the one over s. No, one no, over not one over x. One over s. Uh, one over s. It's lambda squared or two squared. Not in hands by a to the two. Okay, the, the sub iconal limit, the, the corrections you might be afraid of would be Q over S in the target, right? That's what you're talking about? Because we dropped anything over S in our computation. That's the definition of the iconal limit. Yeah, yeah, no, I no, didn't drop anything over Q. It's, it's, it's anything it's, it's, I dropped yeah. is always suppressed by us. You did not drop it yet. You will once you start doing small x evolution. Uh, no, 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 okay, so okay. That, BK, that is the difference between CGC and waves. Yeah. I dropped everything over rest. Why I didn't touch the target. target. You touching the target and keeping some one over rest correction. So, your formalism is not talking about one over s, he's talking about one over q squared. I'm talking about higher twist corrections. How which did no I one over s. s? No one over s. So, why, so at this, what this, point did I drop that? When you start doing a small x evolution. This is what? This is eight to the one third in oh, yeah, I didn't say anything squared, about that. And that's the power of one over s, right? No, this, no, this no. Idiot. No, no, but uh, I completely agree that eventually you might have these issues, but that issue well, uh, is being to... Sorry, sorry the I'm, model sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure you when you... I didn't you say anything about the target. So, so I don't know, but you can think of it this way. You, you have your... Uh, suppose there is no evolution. You're setting initial conditions for a small evolution, right? You, yes, you, but you that's where you're dropping terms, right? Well, yeah. I'm not. He's not specifying what his, what his dipoles are. For the He's moment, all this complicated physics models. you're discussing, I didn't touch. I touched the easy perturbative. Right, but, but if you eventually want this to be useful for generating no, I, I agree. Yeah, it's like saying you don't know. want to That's exactly an interesting to subject to discuss. You but don't know how the calculator so is. You are saying that it's not worthless. It's not worth to calculate the efficient functions if you don't know how to calculate matrix error. That's not how we work. We first calculate 
coefficient functions, and then somebody else or we will think how to calculate matrix element. But that's too In other words, you're too great to stop down to such a bony problem. No, 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 no. Are, this yeah. is too complicated for me. Yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. he's for saying me, that you are calculating the cohesion function in front of you, uh, this um, Nielsen line. Yes, you said that's a stupid thing because when you will be calculating matrix element of this Nielsen line? It's a stupid thing. I'm just asking that. Um, maybe, the maybe, 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 no, maybe. No, 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 no. Calculating higher twists up at the top of the yeah, diagram, but there are higher twists you neglect at the bottom of the diagram, and no one knows how. I keep completely agree. That's yeah, a very interesting question. I agree. So this but this is not the same order as I did. This will be related to whoever wants to use my result. Yeah. Well, it's more it's, it's really you will have too, too much MV in the small x region. And probably some twist free GPD. Ultimately, you want to calculate the yeah. cross section for the vector meson production, the yes. uh, vector meson production. To calculate that cross section, you will need to address the problem. No, a computer field. That's a very interesting problem. Problem. Will, but but you probably nobody will. encountered it well, because, because nobody did that. Yes. Some of the terms so of the same order. What's wrong with that? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, but no, one is included to the same. Of course, because that's kind of a hard experiment. There will be some okay, products so or whatever, but they will, be, they will be well, di well different because one of them deals with the... Uh, oh, the they're, very, they're very separate. I agree. Yeah, they're they're separate, but they're of the same order. So what? No, it wasn't yeah. to be included. I think we agree with this. Yes, so, but you so really thought that he's neglecting, but he's not there yet. Uh, okay. I see. He's not, he hasn't been yeah, using the complicated model. model yeah, wasn't very not for you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, eventually, that would be a very yes, interesting yeah. question to discuss, but so far, I didn't touch that. So, <laughs> okay, okay. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone left? <laughs> All right.